Chapter 16, the solar system. Um, chapter 15, we talked about the Earth exclusively and how we navigate on the Earth and find our way around. We started referencing um, the uh, outer space, for lack of a better term. And now we're going to move uh, from Earth with a couple more things about the Earth first and move out from the Earth into the solar system and talk about planets and dwarf planets. So let's share. There we go. And we're going to make a slideshow out of this. There we go. All right. <clears throat> Now we're getting into what is traditionally called astronomy, which is the study of anything beyond the Earth's atmosphere. And of course, astro comes from uh, the root word for star. And nomi means the uh, name of, or sometimes we say the study of astronomy. All right. Um, if we're, if we're talking about the entire universe, including the earth, we're referencing everything that we know exists. And there's some, uh, schools of thought that say we don't know everything that exists. We can't see everything that exists, um, either in what we consider the bounds of our universe or they may even be outside the bounds of our universe. We'll never see that, of course. So this is uh, in, in the realm of theoretical uh, physics or cosmology. But the universe is everything that we see in terms of energy, matter, and the space through which matter moves and through which energy is exchanged. Now, our, our home is in a galaxy, and we'll talk a little bit more about galaxies in the future, but a galaxy is simply a collection of stars, and it's a collection of stars that are organized in such a way that they're distinct from other collections of stars um, on a massive scale. Um, and our Milky Way galaxy, we know now, and it's, it's taken a while for us to come to this conclusion, our Milky Way galaxy is one of a perhaps 50 billion galaxies scattered throughout the universe. So this is a, this is a very small place we're living in. And the solar system is just one of the stars in that galaxy. Uh, we have a sun, of course, uh, that provides a, a center of gravity and energy for our uh, system. Nine planets, nine planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, That's only eight, so that's an error. And I'll explain, I'll explain what that error actually is uh, when we get to the discussion of dwarf planets. So that should be eight. We only have eight planets because Pluto, within the last decade, has been demoted from a planet to a dwarf planet. So the other we only have eight planets then. Uh, we have several dwarf planets and we're discovering more all the time. We have asteroids, comets, meteoroids, uh, other objects both known and unknown in these two locations, the Kuiper Belt and the Oort Cloud. And I have to define those as we go. 
So as I said before, the sun supplies the energy for nearly all the life on planet Earth. Uh, but there are some life forms that derive their energy from other sources. Some are primordial energy that was accumulated from the beginning of the solar system, and some are uh, uh, use chemical changes that don't require the sun. In other words, uh, changing from um, one form of element or compound into another form that has no connection to the sun. Most, however, most living systems on the on the earth um, are dependent upon the sun to supply the steady flow of energy. All right, a little review. The electromagnetic spectrum, you remember, uh, encompasses a, where, a wide range of frequencies. Right? And at the uh, low energy end of the spectrum is radio waves. And then we move through microwaves, infrared, the visible range is a very narrow band. Then we increase energy as we go through ultraviolet, x-rays, gamma rays. These are all the, um, this is the entire energy regime for the electromagnetic spectrum that we know of. And astronomers use various sections of this spectrum to study the universe from a distance. Most of what we know about the universe is delivered in this form as light. Uh, we're beginning to move out uh, into the universe. We have uh, several probes orbiting and landed on Mars. We have some on Venus, uh, circling Venus. We even have one around Mercury. Um, we had one around Jupiter for a while had one around Saturn for a while. Um, we have two uh, voyagers that um, have left the solar system. They did what was called a, a grand tour of the planets, just flybys. And now they just keep flying and they have left the solar system, but they're still, still sending us information about what's out there. Um, the most recent one that has gone to a distance uh, was um, New Horizons. It was a spacecraft that was sent specifically to investigate Pluto. All right. Most of the energy, if, if you're trying to observe the universe from the Earth's surface, you have to be aware that the atmosphere above the earth um, will absorb some of those light, those frequencies of light, which means that you won't get that information. Uh, you have to be above the atmosphere or very high in the atmosphere to get any of that information from particular wavelengths. Um, and this is a, what we might call an, uh, an absorption spectrum for the atmosphere. So if the, if the line, this black line with the uh, sort of goldish color under it is maximum at 100% um, opacity. So what this means is that the atmosphere absorbs at this level 100% of all the energy um, that comes in from outer space to the atmosphere. And these high energy bursts are, the absorption of that energy is a good thing because this is damaging radiation, especially gamma rays. X-rays are bad enough and ultraviolet, this is a little overstated because um, some ultraviolet will make it through our atmosphere. Just go out on a sunny summer day for a few hours and you'll find out how much ultraviolet you can absorb because your skin will turn red and if, if it's not burnt to a crisp, then in a few days you'll get a tan. Otherwise, you'll get blisters. 
but there are specific wavelengths in here. And I think that's what this dip means right here, is that you're starting to get ultraviolet radiation penetrate the atmosphere. A large portion of the visible spectrum does make it through, although there's some at the red end of the spectrum that's beginning to be absorbed. Um, as you move into the infrared, uh, there's, there's some absorption there. Um, and a large part of the infrared radiation is absorbed by the atmosphere. <clears throat> but um, compared to, if we're observing other heavenly bodies, outside the solar system in our galaxy or further galaxies uh, sometimes infrared is a better choice because visible radiation from those sources can be obscured whereas in many cases the infrared radiation coming from those uh, uh, stars or gas clouds or whatever the case may be uh, will penetrate and you get a different picture of the universe so sometimes uh, observing the same area of space in different wavelengths gives you a more complete picture of what's out there. Now, radio waves um, are, they go right through the atmosphere. They're not, um, and the fancy word is attenuated. These uh, wavelengths of radio waves are not attenuated in this range. Some longer wavelengths are absorbed but um, we set up our telescopes and our detectors so that they will detect radio waves that are, will penetrate the earth's atmosphere now of course you can always take your telescope and send it into space which is what we did with the hubble space telescope and this is a model of it right here um, then uh, it will absorb i mean it will receive all wavelengths All right. Um, we, we'll probably talk about it later, but I'll just mention um, there's another thing that goes on. I, I think actually we did talk about this um, when we were doing optics. When light passes through the Earth's atmosphere, the refractive index of various layers of the atmosphere changes. And you've learned, you learned that refractive index uh, leads to a change in refractive index leads to a bending of light so when you're observing something um this these uh layers of atmosphere are constantly changing and what that the evidence for that is twinkling stars they twinkle because the atmosphere is unstable the refractive index at different layers varies and you get this twinkling effect well, large telescopes have been able to cancel that out and they use what's called adaptive optics. So uh, in some form or fashion, either in the main mirror of a large telescope or in uh, part of the optical pathway, you have uh, adjustable optics and what you need is a reference point. So they used to use a bright star in the field, but now they, they create an artificial star by shining a, a laser beam from the telescope straight up into the sky and computers measure the, the twinkle and make opposite adjustments in the optical system so it cancels out. So our earthbound telescopes now are very good at observing uh, without that distortion. And besides that, you can make a telescope um, the size is virtually unlimited on the Earth's surface, but there's only such, you can only get so big when you go into space because you gotta, you gotta expend the energy to get it up there. Okay. All righty. So here's a large, this is the very large array uh, in New Mexico. And what that means is that there are several dishes that are receiving radio waves, right, from 
this area of the spectrum, radio waves, and each of these dishes is pointed in the same direction. Now, why do they need so many? Well, uh, without going into too much detail, um, in order to discern two closely spaced objects in space, uh, bigger is better. So the bigger your telescope is, the uh, better, the more likely you are to discern two star, two say two stars. So that's a binary system. You have two stars that are orbiting one another very close at, at a great distance. And the it's not the absolute distance between the stars, but the angular distance. Right? So you have this very narrow angle. And if you have a small telescope, it just looks like one star. But if you have a very large telescope, then you might be able to resolve the two stars. Well, um, building a telescope big enough to resolve some structures is impractical. So what we do is we use several telescopes spaced far apart and aimed at the same point of the sky. And we can uh, electronically, or using our computers, recombine those signals into a single signal and and create in the computer a telescope with the aperture that's as big as the array. Okay, so that's the best I can do on in a short version of describing. So still bigger is better. These are optical telescopes on uh, the top of Mauna Kea in Hawaii. This is an extinct volcano on the big island, I believe. Uh, and it's at very high altitude in the neighborhood of uh, 14,000 feet, I think. But the, the nice thing about going high is you have a lot of the atmosphere is below you. Plus, very often you're above the weather. Now, it's very cold up there, but the atmosphere is more stable. So these are ideal locations. Plus, um, Mauna Kea is uh, in the tropics. It's near the equator. Maybe not right on it, but close enough. And the further south you are, the more of the southern skies that you can see. Remember, if you have a, uh, if you're trying to look at skies from the Earth, and you've got stars out here, if you're sitting here, say right there. And let's see, let's maybe have stars down here. You can see this star, you can see that star. You might even be able to see this star. But this star, the Earth blocks your view. So if you move further south, you can see the stars that you used to, plus this one. Um, and you might lose some of the stars in the northern hemisphere, but there are other telescopes up there. So. Um, it's a compromise. Okay. Um, a little bit of history of astronomy. The 19th and 20th century, well, actually earlier than that, when uh, Galileo invented uh, his telescope, 16th century. That was not the earliest example of astronomy. Humans have been looking at the sky forever. We find archeological evidence of uh, observations and drawings, whatever structures that can only be explained by invoking uh, astronomical observation sites. These ancient cult cultures, um, they were observing the sun, the moon, and various celestial objects. In fact, um, the stars tend to stay put in, in reference. So as the Earth moves in its orbit, 
the stars seem to, to just stay put. Now, there we know now that they're all in motion, but um, to ancient cultures, they tended to stay put. But there were some things that they observed in the sky, besides the moon and the sun, that tended to move around. They were called planeta. There are the planets. And planeta means wanderer. So the planets tended to wander across the sky. In fact, um, depending on which one you're looking at, sometimes they tended to, uh, to move night after night. They tended to move, move, move. And then all of a sudden they stop and move backwards for a little bit. And then they move forward again. Okay. I'll try to explain that one later if I, if I remember. Um, they were able to observe the solar cycle. How long does it take the earth to return to a position in its, wherever it is, so that the sky looks the same at night? All right. So they, they counted 365 days, roughly, that, that it would take the earth to do that. Now, in the beginning, they didn't realize that that was because the earth revolved around the sun. So it, you see a different night sky each day, it's changing, and then it comes back to the same place in one solar cycle, one solar year. They also noted lunar cycles, right? The, the moon would go through phases like it would go full moon and then it would start to lose that, the dark would move up on it and it'd get to half moon and then it'd go to disappear completely. We'd see the uh, a dark side and then it would start reappearing again. And it would go through that cycle in about 29 and a half days. That was the month. And the month comes from a root word, which means moon. So they developed calendars so they could mark the, the time. And actually, what was more important, two things are more important. Agricultural purposes. When is the best time to plant your crops? When is the harvest time? So forth and so on. And religious holidays. Okay. And when they have different calendars to mark the changing of the months and the days of the year and the seasons. They noted the seasons. Remember, we know why the seasons occur now, right? We covered that in chapter 15 because of the tilt of the earth. But one of the Mayan calendars had 18 months in it with only 20 days. And then they had one month by itself for five days. So that was, that was kind of weird because uh, in 20 days, the moon doesn't go through a full cycle. So there must have been some other reason for that for the 18 months. Um, they did predict that the earth would end in 2012 based on the Mayan calendar. So we, uh, we shot a movie. Somebody made a lot of money. Um, but the earth didn't end. The universe didn't come to a halt. There are pyramids, these structures, I know what a pyramid looks like, structures uh, in different parts of the world. Uh, Egypt is the most famous, but there were pyramids also in the New World. The Old World pyramids were, well, it wasn't just Egypt. They had some that were built, uh, that were older than Egyptian pyramids that were built in the uh, uh, Mesopotamia. Uh, and many of those have been identified as astronomical observatories, but they, they actually, the theory now is that they were used, they had multi-purpose. The pyramids brought you closer to, the high priest brought him closer to the heavens, um, but they also were oriented in such a way that they could be used as astronomical observatories. Now, the Egyptian pyramids uh, were, were largely tombs but they were oriented with astronomical observation in mind. You know, uh, the flat surfaces were east, west, and north, south.
there were other, some, many prehistoric stone and earthworks that uh, researchers speculate were also used as possible observatories, like uh, Stonehenge. Stonehenge was just one of many of the stone structures that are found in uh, uh, England. Now, these um, celestial cycles are still relevant even in modern cultures, um, and they inform us about uh, planting, harvesting, so forth, those seasons. Um, there are even religious uses that are kind of um, grandfathered in from uh, earlier times, earlier centuries. Uh, birthdays, of course, we celebrate birthdays once a year until you get to a certain age and then you sort of don't want to think about getting older. Um, we even uh, have a fall semester, spring semester. Our academic years are built around that. Um, monthly bills come due. Paychecks, hopefully. Um, and for the foreseeable future, we only know that time flows in one direction. So we have to order our lives to accommodate it. And I've said before, and I'll say it again, nature just does what it does. And science and even culture scrambles to keep up. It's like nature's going to keep doing what it's doing, whether we're here or not. So if we want to understand it, we have to build some structure into it so that we can wrap our minds around it. And seasons, calendars, so forth, that's one way that we uh, accommodate. This is a, uh, uh, a restored uh, Mayan pyramid called Chichen Itza, one of the more popular tourist sites. And it has a north, south, east, west orientation. Plus it has a, a lots of steps <laughs> to get up here to the top where the high priest would perform ceremonies. Um, they believe even human sacrifices. Let's see, I'm not sure where this one is. Pyramid of the niches. This one could be in, well, it could be Mayan, I'm, I'm not sure. Or it could be in uh, Southeast Asia. There, there are several pyramid-like structures in Southeast Asia, too. All right, so let's get back to uh, uh, astronomy. Okay, the solar system is a complex system. Believe me, it's very complex, of moving mass masses. The larger of those masses are planets and they're all held together by gravitational forces. The sun is the largest of all the, the masses uh, at the center, and it has a major influence on how the, plant, how the planets, how other members of the solar system move, but they all have gravitational effect on each other. Um, Isaac Newton uh, proposed that and gave us a law to govern those forces. <clears throat> but every mass affects every other mass. All right. So, okay, here I got it right. <laughs> Revolving around the sun, eight major planets and lots of minor moons. The Earth only has one moon. That appears to be unusual. Uh, planets either have no moons or they have two or more, several moons, many of them large numbers of moons. So um, we're up to about 160 moons orbiting planets now. Actually orbiting planets and dwarf planets too. Dwarf planets, some of them have moons. Uh, at this point, we've identified three dwarf planets, but the, the list is sure to grow. 
there are thousands of other objects. And the worry is that some of those objects might be uh, orbit crossing objects for the Earth, in which case we may have a collision down, down the line with an asteroid or a comet or some other meteoroid. And we, we have to define those terms too. Um, early on, uh, coming out of the Middle Ages, the consensus, which apparently was driven by church doctrine, was that the earth was at the center of the universe, in fact, not just the solar system. This geocentric model um, held that the earth was motionless and everything else moved around it. So the sun orbited the earth, all the planets orbited the earth, everything else, the earth was at the center. And um, people who studied this came up with some pretty wild uh, geometries to explain those motions. Because if you're operating on a false premise and you try to tweak that theory, that model, um, sometimes it takes massive tweaks to make it work. And uh, even then, it fell short. Right. Um, this model was inherited actually from ancient Egypt, Claudius Ptolemy. Um, it was difficult to explain how the planets moved with the Earth at the center. And like I said, complex geometries uh, were proposed by several authors. It wasn't until uh, Copernicus proposed the heliocentric model where the sun was at the center. When he did that, then the light as it were came on and the model was so much simpler to uh, use to solve the motions of objects in the sky. This simpler model, like I said, allowed mathematical predictions of planet positions. Now, Copernicus, Copernicus didn't develop those uh, mathematical models, uh, but he inspired the movement of other scientists in this period called the Renaissance toward uh, a proper understanding of how the planets moved and how, how things moved in the solar system. Uh, he never proved his theory, but he had several followers. Okay, um, observations of the skies. Uh, this was before, just before the telescope was invented. So observations had to be made with devices that measured uh, positions, angles, so forth, relative to where you are on the surface of the Earth. And there was none better at this than the Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe. He was master observer of the stars and the planets. And he had compiled massive data set observations of the planets uh, in particular. Um, These observations were not published until two years after his death. But he had what we would call a suitor, right? <laughs> he was being courted by a uh, mathematician. His name was Johannes Kepler. Kepler was, um, he, he coveted Brahe's data <laughs> with, uh, with a passion. And he, he went to, Brahe and Brahe wouldn't give him his data, but he did um, remain in Brahe's circle for quite some time, um, helping him with other things. <clears throat> um, 
And eventually Brahe relented and let Kepler access his data. And with that data, uh, Kepler was able to formulate his three laws of planetary motion. And we'll cover those shortly. But while we're on the topic of Brahe, um, he was recognized by um, uh, naming a crater on the moon after him. And there it is. It's a very prominent feature. Huge crater, 54 miles wide and three miles deep. Right? All you need, actually, if you've got a good pair of binoculars um, on a clear night, you can see that feature on the moon. Okay, Kepler. Let's see. Uh, he was born in 71, 1571, died in 1630. Let's see how that coincides with Brahe. Brahe was 46 to 01. Okay, so Brahe was about 30 years older than Kepler. He was a mathematician and astronomer. In fact, he made ends meet me uh, by teaching uh, children of rich clients. And once Brahe gave in, he helped him organize his massive store of data. Um, but Brahe wouldn't let him have it and use it for his calculations until after he died and the data was published. But my guess is that Kepler was getting some pretty good ideas by helping him catalog his data. He was, you know, he wasn't just looking at these pages and, and seeing the numbers and organizing for, for Brahe. I'm convinced that he was tabulating <laughs> as he went. But he, he did have full access to the data after Brahe died. So Kepler came up with these three laws. Kepler's first law is also named the law of elliptical paths. It's very simple. It just says that all the planets in the solar system, now this is the heliocentric model, recall, all planets uh, move in elliptical paths around the sun. Okay, not circular paths, ellipses. Remember from math what an ellipse is. An ellipse is like a, a stretched out circle. Right? And it has two foci, focuses. Oops. And the way you draw an ellipse is you uh, put a nail here and a nail here. And you have a string that you tie from here and out to here and here, like that. And you put your pencil right there. And you keep the string tight and you just move it around like this. You keep the string tight all the way around. And you get an ellipse. But what Brahe said, um, no, excuse me, what Kepler said with his first law was that the planets move, right? There's a planet, move in these elliptical orbits, and the sun is at one of the foci. So let's say this would be the sun. So the planet moves around like that. Okay? That's the law of elliptical paths. So we have long axis and short axis. Long axis. Short axis, okay? Now, I think I've mentioned before, an ellipse is one of the conic sections. Um, when you have a cone, like that, right? You can have a plane cut through your cone. If it cuts through this way, you have a circle. Right? You have a perfect circle. If it cuts like this, you have an ellipse. Okay? If it cuts um, 
like this parallel to one side, you have a parabola. And if it cuts perpendicular to the axis, but off center, like this, there's this, the center axis, then you have a hyperbola. Now, each one of these has uh, mathematical formulas associated with it. But this is, if you ever hear conic section, that's what they're talking about. All right. <clears throat> so that was Kepler's first law, the law of elliptical paths. I forgot I had this slide. This is how you draw an ellipse. Uh, this also incorporates some interesting features of the ellipse that we'll reference in a few minutes. Uh, besides the two foci, it has a major axis, right? This length right here. And a semi-major axis. Well, a minor axis is this way, but the more important one that Kepler uses later is the semi-major. Semi means half, half the major axis. So this distance from this center of the ellipse to the outer length through one of the foci is the semi-major axis. And it'll be the same length here as on this side, okay? Oh, so as a practical example, the semi-major axis is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun. Right? If the Earth is here, then it's a short distance. If the Earth is here, it's a different distance. If the Earth is here, it's a different distance. So the semi-major axis is the average of all these distances of the planet to the Sun. Um, all right. And by the way, this distance from the Earth to the Sun, the average is known as an astronomical unit. So when you hear astronomical units, like the star is, or the planet is so many astronomical units away, that means it's uh, a measurement, the unit of measure is the average distance of the Earth to the Sun. And that's 1.5 times 10 to the eighth kilometers uh, in the metric system, in the English system, it's 93 million miles. All right. So, Kepler's second law, the law of equal areas. If you draw an imaginary line, also known as a radial vector, from the sun to the planet, and then you consider the area that's being swept out in a period of time, this area is swept out by the Earth, okay? Over here, this area is swept out by the Earth in the same amount of time. So notice that out here, farther from the sun, the same amount of time gets you a shorter distance traveled. Over here, greater distance traveled when you're close to the sun. The thing that's equal is area A1 and A2. So the planet sweeps out in the same time interval, the same area. Kepler, he was pretty sharp. He took those, those raw data observations from Brahe and he came up with this. Now, how do we know it's correct? Because this allows us to predict actual positions of the planets or any astronomical object orbiting the sun. It works. It's a predictor. So at perihelion, peri means close to. So at the closest approach of the earth to the sun, the earth is moving fastest. The very fastest speed. Now this also goes back to the conservation of momentum, right? 
but we'll not beat that horse right now. Let's stick with Kepler. So the perihelion occurs for Earth about January 4th, closest to the sun. Aphelion, ap meaning away from, the farthest away from the sun, occurs on about July 5th. Okay, and this perihelion, aphelion uh, naming convention works for any heavenly body orbiting the sun. When we say the important part is the helion, helion means sun. So close to the sun, farthest from the sun, and that works for anything, planets, comets, asteroids, whatever. So we know that um, since this area is equal for each one, then in order to make the area equal with a shorter um, axis here, the shorter radius, then the planet or whatever has to be moving faster to cover that distance and sweep out the area that's required to be equal. Kepler's third law. It's a little harder to digest, but it's nonetheless true. It's called the harmonic law. What it means, what it says is, if you square the period of the planet, and there's that term again, sidereal, which refers to stars. So your reference point is not the sun anymore. It's the stars. So the sidereal period is how long does it take the planet to go around in its orbit and come back to a same reference star. That's the period. How long does it take to make an orbit? And then this term is the uh, semi-major axis that we said before, right? The major axis, take half of it. That distance cubed is uh, proportional to the square of the period. And this is a constant. And it's the same for all planets. So this constant is um, let me think for a second. When we say something is proportional to something else, then there is always some proportionality constant involved. So the constant uh, is there to make sure that the units jive. So let's go to calculate the period of a planet. So if you're, if you're we're gonna use the formula, calculate the period of a planet whose orbit has a semi-major axis of 1.52 astronomical units, right? So there's your formula, right? And um, we're gonna use the K value as uh, one year squared over astronomical units cubed. It's one to one actually. And the reason we're using this one is because this period is astronomical unit. I mean, this semi-major axis is astronomical units, and the time period is years. Right? So if we, if we settle on that, year here, astronomical unit there, then this conversion works. We cancel the astronomical units. They're both cubed. <coughs> and then um, that means that this... 3.51 years squared is equal to period squared. So we just take the square root of both sides of the equation. So 3.51, take the square root, <coughs> and that's 1.87. So the period for a planet orbiting at 1.52 astronomical units is 1.87 years. So in the time it takes the Earth to go around the, the uh, sun once, um, whatever planet this is, is still trying to catch up. Which just means 
the farther planet is from the sun, the longer its period, the longer it takes to go around the sun. Guess what? This is for Mars. Mars is at 1.52 astronomical units. All right. So let's say the, the planet's orbiting at 30 astronomical units. That's way out there. 30 times as far from the sun as the Earth is. All right. So we plug in our numbers again. All right. There we go. 164 and third years it takes for this planet to go around the sun. I bet that's way out there near Pluto. Didn't say. <laughs> no. So maybe it's just made up. Okay, now we're going to look at, let me get, get my hard copy here, turn to the right page. Yeah. Now we're going to talk about the planets and some uh, agreed upon terms for planets so we can discuss them on the same level for every planet. Right. The mass of the universe, uh, the solar system is 99.87% concentrated in the sun. So most of the mass of the solar system is in the sun. Uh, the rest of it, 0.13%, uh, which is almost all of it. Uh, well, no, 0.13% is what's remaining. Jupiter is more than half of that, right? So there's some speculation that Jupiter was a failed star. It's massive, but just one, wasn't quite massive enough to ignite nuclear reactions. So that's the whole premise behind, um, uh, oh, I'm trying to remember the author's name. It escapes me for a minute. The, the book in the movie 2010, the Jupiter was turned into a, a star by some uh, alien intelligences. Uh, Arthur C. Clarke, excuse me. Arthur C. Clarke wrote both 2001 and 2010. And in 2010, we turned, well, the movie, we turned Jupiter into a star. In the book, the uh, expedition went to Saturn. So, agreed upon terms, uh, any planets that are that have orbits smaller than the Earth are classified as inferior, right? And there are two of them. They, they come inside our orbit. That's Venus closest to us, and then closer to the sun is Mercury. Um, it's interesting that when we observe Venus and Mercury uh, in the night sky, uh, they tend to behave differently for our observational purposes than planets that are outside our orbit because of our position in observation. They're always going to be close to the sun. So you can only see them either in the early morning or right after the sun goes down. So Venus is often called sometimes the morning star, sometimes the evening star. Planets with orbits larger than the Earth are superior, and they can be observed anywhere in the sky because they're, they're rotating out there beyond, beyond us and the sun. So the only time you can't see them is when they go behind the sun. Okay, let's get our definitions nailed down here for movements. All planets revolve around the sun. So revolution means orbit. All right. And they all move counterclockwise. That is with earth as a reference, right? If here's the sun 
and here's Earth, then this is North, South. And with that as our reference point, we're looking down from the north. We see that all planets move counterclockwise. This is called prograde motion, simply because that's the way the Earth goes, so we get to name it. Prograde. Prograde motion is this way. Um, now, each planet rotates. So revolution is the whole body moving around some center, the sun. Rotation is the body itself spinning like a top. And um, all but two planets rotate counterclockwise. So they're prograde motion, prograde orbits for all the planets. Prograde rotation for all but two. So six of them uh, rotate counterclockwise and two of them rotate clockwise. Retrograde motion. And those two planets are Venus and Uranus. Okay, so this is kind of a uh, a schematic of what you might see if you are at sufficient distance. Uh, you wouldn't see these lines, of course, because we drew those in to show the orbits. And um, uh, we have here, let's see, there's, Earth is the third ring out, and then Mars is the fourth ring. And then inside the um, inferior planets, Mercury and Venus are in here, and then everybody else is out here. So there's Jupiter, and then Saturn, then Uranus, then Neptune, and Pluto's drawn in here, but Pluto now is not considered a planet. Pluto is considered a dwarf planet. And I'll give you the definition for that. Uh, the reason for, for that change uh, is in the the standardization of the definition of a planet. All right. Now there's another way to, to think of and label planets. The terrestrial planets, uh, like, and, and that comes from the word terra, which means earth. So the, the ones that uh, share something in common with earth, Mercury, Venus, earth, and Mars, are the terrestrial planets. They have very high percentage of the more massive elements. Like, could think of rocky planets. And these are all inner planets. And that stands to reason. If at one time during the formation of the solar system, and we'll talk about this in more detail in uh, future chapters, um, when the Earth was really pumping out the uh, solar wind, uh, any light elements that were on the surface, gases or evaporative things like water, were just blown away. But if you are further from the sun, uh, you were also colder, and the solar wind was less intense, and you were able to retain uh, these lighter elements. But the terrestrial planets were basically uh, more massive, more dense than the outer planets. So those are the terrestrial planets. The other planets from Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, they were all called Jovian planets. And Jovian refers to Jupiter. So Jupiter and beyond are also known uh, in common term, the gas giants. Right? They have very high percentage of the less massive elements, like uh, hydrogen and helium and, and various mixtures of other gases. 
All right, so here's sort of a relative arrangement by size, right? Mercury's tiny. Mars is a little bit bigger. Venus is just a little bit smaller than Earth. But when you get to Jupiter and Saturn, they are massive. Notice the sun is in the background. <laughs> the sun is just, it dwarfs all of them. Then Uranus and Neptune. All right. So, um, another, and other terms. What do we mean by conjunction? When you're observing planets in the night sky, um, they tend to move, and they move at different, they have different periods. So the, the further you go out, the longer the period. But periodically, the planets tend to line up. They don't, they don't usually block each other, but they're, because their orbits are, are slightly inclined um, above and, and below the, the plane of the sun's, uh, of the sun's uh, disk, for lack of a better term. But when, when these two planets are lined up, we say they're in conjunction with one another. Um, if they are uh, on opposite sides of the sun, which is kind of strange to think about because if one of them's on, on the opposite side of the sun, one's on the other side, then you can only see the one that's um, on your side, on the Earth's side of the sun, because you can see it in the night sky. But the one on the other side, if it's in superior conjunction, it's blotted out by the sun. So if you try to look at it during the daytime, you can't see it. So I think this is just in there to, for balance, superior conjunction. Inferior conjunction, planets are on the same side of the sun. Then you can see them both at the same time. This is the one that most people consider conjunction, the inferior conjunction. Okay, when we say sidereal period, we mentioned sidereal before, and it pertains to a star, a fixed point in the sky. So what's the sidereal period? Well, it's the time interval for a planet to make one revolution around the sun with respect to that fixed star. Okay, so that's your reference point. Mercury's sidereal period is pretty quick, 88 days, 88 Earth days. Uh, the other possibility is synodic period. Um, this is the time interval between two successive conjunctions of the planet with the sun as observed from Earth. The uh, Mercury's sidereal period is much, much shorter than the synodic period. So why is the synodic period longer? I hope I put an explanation here. Okay, I correct myself. The, when we talk about conjunction, now we're defining the sidereal period in terms of a star, and we're also determining, uh, defining the synodic period in terms of the conjunction of that planet with us. So if we, if we, if we reach conjunction, with a planet uh, on, it doesn't matter if it's superior or inferior, but for the planet to go around and reach conjunction again, takes more time, right? Because if here's the earth and here's Mercury, then for Mercury to go around like this there, that's 360 degrees. 
right? That would be the um, sidereal period, roughly, because it would be referencing a star. But for the synodic period, where you're talking about conjunction, um, we're in conjunction here with Mercury, but by the time Mercury gets around, Earth has moved over here. So Mercury has to go around here, plus uh, another 26 days, 28 days, 28 days, in order to catch up with us. Right. So that's the definition, the difference between sidereal period referencing a fixed point in space and the synodic period referencing uh, Earth in conjunction with the planet. So here we have uh, Earth in inferior conjunction with Mercury, right? So we're both on the same side and Earth in superior conjunction with Mercury, okay? Now, just to reference, um, Mars is, opposition, is in opposition with Earth on the opposite side of the sun. So it's in superior conjunction with the Earth over here and inferior conjunction with the Earth over here. So Mars orbit is moving here and moving slower, whereas Mercury's orbit is moving faster, but still Earth is moving. All right. Okay, now we're gonna talk about specific planets, I think. Yeah, so we're gonna start with Earth. Earth as just another planet in the solar system. All right, before we were talking about, last chapter we were talking about Earth as um, our home, and how do we get around on it, how do we know where we are. Now we're talking about Earth in relationship to other planets. So the Earth is the third planet from the sun after Mercury and Venus. It's um, mostly solid, roughly spherical, right? I mentioned that last chapter, not exactly spherical, but roughly. It's a rocky bottom and it has lots of water and an atmosphere, right? Without the, the oceans of water and an atmosphere, the climate on the earth would not be conducive to living systems as we know them. And we have water in all three phases. Water vapor, liquid water on the surface of the earth, and ice, ice, snow, whatever the case may be, exist on the earth at the same time. The atmosphere on Earth now is rich in oxygen, roughly 20%. Um, we have a, a, what we consider a temperate climate, right? And this is a relative term, right? It's temperate based upon uh, what's livable for, for most species. And in that respect, with, with life on Earth, which is the only place that we've discovered life, is on Earth, makes Earth unique. It's often called the blue planet, primarily because of its water. So, 21%, um, yeah, maybe if you round it up, it's 21%. Earth crust, um, actually the Earth's crust is over 90% oxygen. The reason for that is most elements in the Earth's crust exist as oxides. In other words, compounds with oxygen in them. So the, the proper term for that is 
we live in an oxidized environment. Now, chemically speaking, that makes sense. But since uh, we don't get to chemistry until the second semester, this term oxidized has little meaning. It's just lots of oxygen. Okay, and these formulas probably won't mean anything to you either, unless you've had chemistry before. But they, these formulas are compounds of these particular types of minerals. Quartz is silicon and oxygen. Calcite is calcium, carbon and oxygen, calcium carbonate. Feldspar is a common mineral in the Earth's crust, which has potassium, aluminum, silicon, and oxygen. They all have oxygen in them. Okay, uh, common rocks at the surface of the earth. There's lots of granite, lots of marble. There are other types. Um, West Virginia has lots of sandstone. Uh, it has lots of, um, not marble, but um, uh, dolomite, calcite in certain counties, particularly Greenbrier. Uh, there's some granite, but uh, there are places on the earth where granite is more prominent, such as uh, Maine. Uh, Georgia has some outcroppings of granite, like uh, Stone Mountain, right? the one that has the Confederate uh, memorial carved into its surface. That's a solid chunk of granite. Right. So there's, that's granite, and granite can, can be different hues also. This is pink granite, I'm pretty sure, used as a uh, uh, headstone. And it's very, very hard and weathers slowly. So it's a good choice if you want your monument to, to remain for centuries. Whereas this one looks like it's probably made out of marble and it weathers rather poorly, uh, particularly in uh, uh, if the acid rain is a polluting factor, will eat away at your marble. So here we go. Earth is not a perfect sphere. It's very close, but it's uh, the proper term for it is an oblate spheroid. Spheroid means it's Oid, it's, it's like a sphere. Like a humanoid is like a human. Spheroid is like a sphere, but it's oblate, which means it's, it's pudgy in one of its axes. Flattened at the poles, bulging at the equator. Right? And that's primarily due to its rotation. Right? It tends to, the spinning top tends to want to pull itself apart. Well, instead of flying apart, the Earth just bulges a little bit in its midsection. So the diameter from north to south pole is 43 kilometers less than it is through the equator, the diameter at the equator. So that's, that's a lot, really, 43 kilometers. But still, relative to its it's uh, average diameter, it's, it's a, just a smidgen. Now, what do we mean by albedo? When we look at um, objects in the universe that are not stars, stars produce their own light. So we're not talking about those. We're talking about objects in the universe that reflect light from stars. And this albedo is a reference to the fraction of the incident sunlight or starlight that is reflected by an object. So if, if a certain amount of energy uh, light energy right, say the sun's over here 
and certain amount of light energy there. So we have energy coming in and bouncing off this object. Then the reflected energy is going to be uh, not 100%. Some of it is absorbed, changed, whatever the case may be. You only get a certain amount of this energy that, see this is uh, incident radiation and this is reflected radiation. So the ratio of those two is equal to albedo. And this can be expressed as a fraction. More often it's expressed as percent. Okay. Uh, Earth's albedo is about 33%. So 67% uh, of the light that strikes the Earth is absorbed. And 33% of it is reflected. goes even less than that. 7%. But from the Earth, the moon is the second brightest object in the sky after the sun. Why? Because it's closer to us than other objects. Okay, that's simple. Um, remember the inverse square law. The further away you are, from an object, the less light you receive from it, either directly or reflected. Right? Or it works for sound also. So when we're determining albedo, there are actually two types of albedo. Um, well, this talks to the reason for the the Earth's higher albedo. It has snow on its surface, it has clouds, water that are much more reflective than the dust on the surface of the moon. Venus has an albedo of 76%. So it's the third brightest object in the sky simply because um, it's further away from us. So it may reflect more light than the moon but it's further away. And one of the reasons is Venus has a permanent cloud cover. And those clouds reflect light very efficiently. They also hold the heat in very efficiently too. So that's why one of the reasons that the surface of uh, Venus is very hot, hot enough to melt lead. All right, um, I thought we were going to get into other terms. All right, okay, we'll talk about it, albedo again. Um, the way albedo is used in that previous slide, this is absolute albedo. So if we were to uh, observe the Earth, Moon, and Venus from the same distance away, then uh, we would be able to measure on the same scale the reflected light. Okay, um, Earth moves, obviously, and it moves different ways. It rotates around its axis, and that gives us a daily cycle. Okay. It revolves around the sun. That gives us an annual cycle. And these are repeated. The daily cycle repeats infinitely. The annual cycle repeats infinitely. Um, other motions that the Earth has. Uh, remember the um, the Earth's rotational axis is set at 23 and a half degrees. But that, that angle, since there's a wobble in the Earth, that angle precesses. And it tends to point 
in a different direction over long periods of time. But that procession will repeat also, eventually. So let's talk about the Earth's rotation on its axis. Um, it took a long time for science to catch up with the reality that Earth rotates on its axis. It's not fixed with everybody else rotating around it. But eventually, um, scientists had to give in. And those who didn't give in just died. <laughs> and they took their doubts with them. It's um, somewhat difficult to prove that the Earth rotates on its axis. So an experiment that was designed by a Frenchman, Jean Foucault, in 1851, um, was a demonstration of the rotation of the Earth on its axis. He used a pendulum. Now, by, the, by this time, of course, the, the steady movement of the pendulum was obvious to everyone. It was established by Galileo. Right? Galileo was um, uh, in church service. And he was, the priest was giving his homily. And uh, Galileo's mind was wandering. And he observed the chandelier in the church was swaying ever so slightly backwards and forwards. So I said, hmm, I wonder if that's regular motion. The term now is periodic motion, swings out and back. Comes back to the same position in a period of time. So he, uh, he timed it. So how did he time it? Didn't have a wristwatch. The watches weren't invented then. Clocks were too big. He timed it with his pulse. Right? His pulse was fairly regular. And he, he found that the pendulum, Galileo found that the pendulum was moving with regular motion. And he noticed that uh, other uh, chandeliers were swinging. Galileo noticed that other pendulums were swinging, but they were, he timed those and they were swinging at different rates. He says, oh, why do these other, all these pendulums have different periods of motion? Takes them different amounts of times to swing backwards and forwards to the same position as before. And he puzzled about it. He eventually decided and was able to, to prove that the difference was the length of the swing from the pivot point to the, the uh, chandelier at the end of the pivot was a different length. So then uh, clockmakers eventually used that as a uh, timing mechanism because a pendulum swings at a regular period depending on its length primarily. So let's go back to Foucault. Foucault um, built a pendulum, a very long pendulum, like hanging from the, the ceiling of a building with a very thin wire that was obviously strong enough to hold a, a large mass at the end, an iron ball. And he set that pendulum in motion. He picked a, um, a, a, a reference point. Um, I don't know what it was, but let's just say for argument's sake, he picked true north. So the north star. So he aimed it at the north star and started it swinging. And he tried to minimize friction because they knew also at that time that friction was a, your, your enemy for motion. So he started it moving with regular period and he checked it. Yep. Yep. Same period every time. Same period. Okay. So he watched it. He noticed uh, that when it came out to this point, he marked a place on the floor. And then an hour later, he marked it again. Oops. It's moved over here. One hour later, 15 degrees. And he kept doing that every hour. It moved 15 degrees, 15 degrees, all the way around, 15 degrees until it got back to that same position. 
And he also noted that when it came back to that same position, it was the same time on the clock. They had they had accurate clocks by this time. So he said, how could that be? Well, his conclusion was that the pendulum wasn't moving because the pendulum had momentum, a swinging momentum that kept it moving exactly the same, pointed at that same star every time. <clears throat> so his conclusion was that the pendulum's not moving because an external reference point, a distant star, was the same aiming point everywhere he measured. So he concluded that the pendulum wasn't moving, the earth was moving underneath. So if the, pen, if the pendulum appeared to move toward the west, the earth must be moving toward the east. So the pendulum was staying put and the earth was moving under it. And that was his evidence for a rotating earth. Let's see, here's one. I'm not sure where that one's located. There are several of them around the world. And they're, they're designed so that um, they've got these little domino things or these little brick scattered around here. And they set it up and then they start it moving. And the tourists come through and they see that uh, it knocks these down periodically. It just keeps moving around, knocks them down. Now, ideally, the perfect Foucault pinion would be set up at the North Pole. Right? That way, uh, the Earth is definitely moving under the axis of this pendulum. But it will still work anywhere on the surface of the Earth here, as long as you aim it at a fixed point in space then the pendulum will still move 360 degrees in one day's time. And this um, hour, 24 hours, remember before we divide 24 into 360 and you get 15 degrees. So 15 degrees per hour is the motion. And that's what Foucault noticed. 15 degrees for every hour. All right, so let's switch gears a little bit. What is Parallax. Well, parallax is the apparent motion or shift in position that occurs when two fixed objects change their relative position to one another. The um, so um, the the best example of that is the easiest way to demonstrate it is if you stretch out your hand and point it at something in the distance. Or I just pointed at that light, right? I think I'm pointing at it. Then you close one eye. Now my finger's over here. Close the other eye. My finger's over here. That's parallax. The apparent motion. My finger didn't move. But the observer moved, right? The observer is one eye versus the other eye. So the object appears to move, my finger appears to move relative to that distant object. So how do we use that in astronomy? Well, we use parallax in astronomy and parallax occurs everywhere. Um, but we're talking about it in terms of astronomy. When the Earth moves around the sun, then what it ap appears to do is uh, the Earth is on one side of its orbit. Let's see. Yeah, let's put the sun in the center. So here's our sun. And here's the orbit, right? So if Earth is on this side, it's looking at a star out here. 
And if it's on this side, it's looking at the same star. Right there, there, right? Well, how can we say that it's moved? Well, we look at that star in relationship to a more distant star. So it appears that this other star has moved. Is Maybe it's sitting over here, but when we look over there, it's moved that way. So the relative positions of the stars tend to move. Um, and with that information, what we can do is use a little trigonometry and we can calculate this angle. That angle theta from here to here. And what does that do? Well, we know this distance and we know this distance, right? Radius of the Earth's orbit. So now we know the diameter. That's the base of our triangle. That's the angle. Now we can tell what is this distance? Just by a little trigonometry. So for close stars, we can use parallax to find out how far away they are. Oh, here's a picture, all right? So here's the Earth on one side and here's the Earth on the other, and the observation tends to, uh, the star appears to move. And the parallax is this angular distance. I'm surprised it's not marked there. Uh, besides the practical application, this is also proof that the Earth moves around the sun because the only way to explain parallax is with this motion of the Earth around the sun, not the Earth being stationary and everybody else moving around it. That would never work. It, you can't explain it with that theory. So the heliocentric theory is the only one that explains this. And this was the, uh, uh, the first method for determining the distance to nearby stars. And we had to have really um, refined optics in our telescope and ability to measure very small angles. Because if this distance is huge, right, which normally it is, I mean, the closest star to us is what, uh, four and a half light years away, or in that neighborhood. Or is it closer? Two and a half light years? It's, it's pretty far. So the parallax angle is going to be small. And the further out you get, the smaller the, the parallax angle. And there comes a point where you can't measure it anymore. There's no way to measure it. So obviously, it's a trigonometric problem. That was the first proof of the orbital movement of the Earth around the sun. The second proof has to do with observations. Um, let's see. We already got that one. Angular discrepancy between the apparent position of the star and its true position. This arises from the motion of an observer relative to the path of the beam of light observed. This is, this is related to parallax. But it's slightly different. So um, we get this uh, measurement of distance in terms of the parsec. And the parsec is a contraction of two parts of the word. It includes parallax, but there's also a second. Okay, so let's, let's go through this methodically. A circle is 360 degrees. Each degree is divided into 60 minutes and each minute into 60 seconds. Right? So each degree has uh, 3,600 seconds. 
right? So one second equals one three hundred and sixtieth of a degree. The parsec is the distance to the star when the star exhibits a parallax of one second. So if that angle is one second, then a parsec is the distance to that star. And that's, that's, con that's constant. Um, the measurement is reliable simply because this base of the triangle is always the same. All right? So if the, if the star is one second of angular distance, that means it is at one parsec distance. If it's um, uh, anything other than that, then it'll be either, either less parsec or more parsec. Okay, let's take a look at the terrestrial planets. They resemble Earth in their uh, crust and internal composition. They're not exactly like though. They just absent the lighter elements. Most of them are relatively small in size. Rocky materials, some metals. Um, the theory is that um, the terrestrial planets at one time might have had, you know, a bunch of gas around them, like the gas giants. Now, we don't know exactly what that history is, but even if it was there, those lighter elements were blown away and the core was left behind. And that's what we have now. So that begs the question, you know, why does, if, if water is volatile enough and it got blown away, and the atmosphere was blown. How did we, how did we get an atmosphere and water on our surface? Well, that's another problem altogether. But these terrestrial planets are similar in composition. Um, they're relatively close together and close to the sun. There are no rings. And when we get to talk, when we get to Saturn, we'll talk about why we think those rings exist. And the smaller planets just don't have the oomph that they would need to create rings. Earth and Mars have moons. The formation of Earth's moon is an entire <laughs> chapter's worth of discussion. So uh, when we get to the discussion of moons, um, I'll introduce that topic, but I can't give it to you in great detail. Um, the Earth moon is believed to have formed from a collision. So that's why the Earth and the moon are similar composition. But the moons around Mars were believed to have occurred by orbit capture. So some asteroid uh, flew in too close and was captured by Mars gravity and eventually the orbit stabilized it at a given distance the orbit of, of both moons because they're very small very small moons the size of the moon earth's moon relative to earth is huge there's only only pluto has one that's that's a bigger ratio of moon to planet actually pluto is not a planet moon to dwarf planet So only on Earth, we have water and oxygen. Water on the surface, oxygen in the atmosphere. All right. So who is this? This is Mercury. Mercury looks like it's been pounded. Looks like the surface of the moon. Um, and 
this is an interesting relationship between Mercury's rotation, right? And it's circling of the sun. It's relationship of its rotation to its revolution, to its orbit. So um, for every two times that Mercury circles the sun, it rotates on its axis three times. So it's really slow relative to uh, its orbit. A spacecraft named Messenger was sent to uh, Mercury. It was launched in 2004, and uh, it flew by January 14th, 2008. So it took it uh, for three and a half years to get there. It had to use some fancy uh, navigation to get there. It flew by again in October 2008. And it flew by again in September 2009. It finally reached orbit in March 2011. Now, what was it doing when it flew by? Well, it was using the gravity of, of uh, Mercury to stabilize its orbit so that it could be captured. The reason these flybys are done uh, by small planets, large planets, whatever the case may be, is they're using the gravitational assistance of the planet either to speed it up or slow the spacecraft down um, so that the, um, the journey to its destination can be accomplished with as little fuel as possible for launch because you want your payload, the satellite itself, to be as large as possible because you want to put instruments into it to make measurements. And if you have to go a direct flight to your destination and then stop there, you're going to have to carry a lot of fuel. And that means your payload has to be very small. So they use this gravity assist. Um, it didn't just fly by Mercury. It flew by Venus and Earth in the process also uh, for gravity assist. So there you go. That, that's what I said in a single statement. <laughs> so we already know Mercury is the closest planet to the Earth. It has a uh, sidereal period of 88 days. That is reference to a distant star it takes 88 days to go around. And it is the fastest. And Kepler could have told you that. Its period is the shortest because it is the closest. It has the shortest semi-major axis. So it has the shortest period also. Mercury was named for one of the Greek gods that was actually stolen by the Romans. <clears throat> he was the messenger. So when you see statues or drawings, you see Mercury's got wings on his heels. So he flies around with his feet. Temperatures on Mercury vary very widely, simply because Mercury is close to the sun and it has no atmosphere. So on the sun side, it's 470 degrees Celsius, which is extremely hot. But on the side facing away from the sun, it's minus 170 degrees Celsius. And there's no um, refraction of light to speak of because there's no atmosphere. So the dark side, I mean, it's the instant you go from light side to dark side, the temperature changes 500 degrees. Practically no atmosphere. I think they have detected small amounts of atmosphere around the planet, but it's not much. At one time, Mercury was believed to be tidally locked with the sun. So what is tidal locking? It's a gravitational effect. Uh, a moon orbiting a planet or a planet orbiting the sun, or whatever it happens to be, uh, when they're tidally locked, the gravitational influence of a larger body has uh, slowed 
the rotation of the planet down or the moon as the case may be such that it now rotates and revolves at the same rate so what that means is one side of the planet would be facing the sun in this case all the time because it rotates at the same rate so it always had the same side facing the sun uh, but we know now that that's not true it's very close it's what we would call a 3-2 harmonic, which is neither here nor there. Uh, true tidal locking is, you can observe that uh, day in and day out, month by month, year by year. Look at the moon. The Earth's moon has one face to the Earth all the time. And the other side, called the dark side of the moon, which isn't always dark, but we just can't see it because it's, uh, tidally locked and the moon rotates at the same rate as it goes around. In other words, its rotational period is exactly 29 and a half days. And its uh, revolution, its orbital revolution around the Earth is 29 and a half days. All right. Venus is the next planet. Uh, this is a, actually two pictures. This first picture was a Venera 13, was a Russian spacecraft. Let's see. This Russian spacecraft landed on Venus, and for a short period of time, I forget how long it was, continued to broadcast signals back to the Earth uh, with pictures. And we find that it's basically just a rocky place, at least where this spacecraft landed in 1982. And then the heat finally got to it and it was destroyed. Um, this picture below is from um, Magellan 13. And I can't remember who orbited, who was sent that one, whether it was the United States or the European Space Agency. I don't believe it was Russia or China or any of those people. But anyway, it orbited um, Venus and it used radar because radar at the right frequency would penetrate the clouds and it gave us a surface picture of Venus. Now this is, this is a false color enhanced, right? These are not true colors for Venus. But these colors mean something to the scientists who developed this uh, picture and uh, they can usually tell elevation and composition sometimes by these false colors. Uh, there was another spacecraft, uh, Akatsuki, which is obviously Japanese, that was sent to uh, investigate Venus. And this is a picture of its cloud cover, right? So it's 100% covered in clouds. <laughs> Um, the planet rotates in a retrograde motion. In other words, instead of rotating counterclockwise, looking down from the north, it rotates clockwise. And the speculation is that this was due to some large impact that sent it spinning the wrong direction. Well, we think wrong direction. It's retrograde, not prograde. Okay, what else about Venus? Um, Venus will approach Earth the closest of any of the other planets. So when they're in uh, inferior conjunction, on the same side, both of us on the same side of the sun, we're only about a quarter of an astronomical unit away. So it's going to be very bright. So because of its brightness, obviously, um, Venus was named after the goddess of beauty by the same name. Can't see the surface from the Earth or from satellites unless you use the proper wavelength. Uh, these clouds obs obscure the vision. 
and the previous picture from Magellan uh, was used radar to image the surface. It's a very volcanically active planet. The uh, atmosphere is about 96% carbon dioxide. Now, when you have that much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that is sufficient for um, global warming, global heat retention, when you have that much. Now, when you have um, 380 to 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that's nothing. So blaming global warming on Earth, the carbon uh, on carbon dioxide concentration is uh, just false on its face. As they would say in, in, the, in the popular political circles now, it's anti-science. But Venus, with this much carbon dioxide, does uh, absorb energy that's coming from its surface and reflect it back to the surface. So that is definite uh, warming on a global scale. It's a very thick atmosphere too. Uh, so thick that the pressure on the surface of Venus is 90 atmospheres. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so that's really, really, really high. So that, that greenhouse effect uh, accounts for much of the high temperature on the surface of Venus, which is similar to the temperature on the uh, sun side of Mercury. Some of that heat comes from the interior of the planet itself, and a lot of it, because of its proximity to the sun, is trapped energy from the sun. It gets through the clouds and is trapped with this greenhouse effect. Uh, has relatively few impact craters. That was discovered by uh, the Magellan radar uh, imaging of the surface, uh, which means that um, two things. Any meteors that try to get through the atmosphere are burned up because the atmosphere is much, much thicker than the Earth's. Any that are big enough to reach the surface, um, the craters that form over thousands and thousands and thousands of years by tectonic activity on the surface have been obliterated. Weathering has just wiped them out. All right, so we skip over Earth and now we're at Mars. So this is um, a true, actually, this is a true color image of Mars. So it, it is a red planet. And we have the polar caps, right, which are predominantly uh, solid carbon dioxide, but there is some water in there also. The red color on Mars is due to, and, and this has been confirmed because we have uh, landed on the surface of Mars and sampled the soils sampled the rocks. So we know that the red color is due to uh, iron oxide. Uh, Mars was named for the Roman god of war. I'm not sure why. We just accept it for now. Um, two outstanding features that, have, uh, that were originally observed uh, from Earth were the polar ice caps and the volcanoes. In fact, the largest volcano that we've been able to find in the solar system is on Mars. Um, like I said, the uh, frozen carbon dioxide, solid carbon dioxide, what we call dry ice, uh, gets larger in the winter. So Mars is tilted on its axis too, and, which means that it has seasons. So this carbon dioxide vapor, it has some frozen water in it. Um, 
and will change with the seasons. So here's that big volcano, Mount Olympus or Mons Veneris. It's massive. It's 24 kilometers high, which is about 18 or 19 miles high. It's about three times that of Mauna Loa. And Mauna Loa, if, if you measure Mauna Loa from the ocean's floor, which is where it started, it's only a little over 10 kilometers high. So uh, this mountain is twice the height of Mauna Loa from its base to its height. This uh, Mars Valley, Valles Marineris, is a huge gash, a canyon through the middle of Mars. It's a monster, dwarfs the Grand Canyon. Four thousand kilometers in length and six kilometers deep. Okay, so let's see. Uh, Grand Canyon would be about uh, one point six, one point seven kilometers deep. So it's quite a bit deeper and much, much longer. Oh, here we go. I was off by a little bit. One point nine kilometers deep for the Grand Canyon about 446 kilometers in length. So geologists are speculating that this, this huge gash in the surface of Mars was caused by a crustal fracture from internal forces. So at one time it's believed that Mars was geologically active and has since grown cold and dead. Uh, if the Earth at one time had any of these major features, then uh, since Earth is more geologically active, those features have been erased. Now let's move to the Jovian planets. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, the gas giants. Obviously much larger than the terrestrials. They're composed mainly of hydrogen and helium. They have a very, very low density, right? 1.2 grams per cubic centimeter. Water is one gram per cubic centimeter. So they're heavier than water. I mean, they're more dense than water on the average, right? The atmosphere will be much lower, but deep in the planets, there's sufficient gravity to compress the gases and make them much more dense. Um, it's believed that they have rocky cores, but there's, there's no proof. Iron and silicates, maybe. It's also believed that uh, above that layer, rocky core, they have a, a thick layer of frozen methane, ammonia, and water. Actually, um, there's, there's some evidence that there's a new form of element down there, metallic hydrogen, which just means, um, well, let me just say this, metals are electrically conductive because the electrons of the metal are free to move from one atom to the next fairly easily. So if you push from one side with the voltage, you're gonna pop out the other side with electrons, which means current passes easily through a metal. This metallic hydrogen is a form of hydrogen that also allows easily electron movement. So what that does is um, that accounts for the magnetic, strong magnetic fields around these gas giants, right? It's believed that the earth has a magnetic field simply because uh, part of its core is liquid and moving metal like that generates an electrical current that creates the uh, magnetic 
um, shroud around the earth. And it's a good thing too, because it protects us from the solar wind. Um, so when the, when the uh, solar system was first forming, the most common elements were hydrogen and helium, by far. That's why the sun formed from hydrogen and helium. It's mostly hydrogen and helium because the percentage of these two elements was 99.999% of the elements. And the other elements were minor components. And this happened roughly um, 5 billion years ago. So the sun's been burning for 5 billion years. So the, the solar wind, and I mentioned this earlier, the solar wind from the sun, uh, which is charged particles that are blown off from the sun, and they're constantly occurring. They, they, they come out all the time. Um, due to this solar wind, uh, the small size, now we're talking about the terrestrial planets here, the small size of the terrestrial planets and the lack of a protective electromagnetic shield, except for Earth. Most of these less massive elements escaped the gravitational pull of the inner planets, whereas the solar wind just blew them away. The Earth, however, had its protection and the effect of the solar wind on the Earth's atmosphere and surface elements, these lighter elements, was much less. And what it left behind was the rocky cores. Okay. Let's see, I better keep up with my hard copies here. So this, uh, the reason this slide is what appears to be out of sequence. It's not with the terrestrial planets. I mean, we already started talking about the Jovians. We want to compare the um, formation of the terrestrial planets compared to the formation of the Jovian planets. So these are uh, physical parameters for the planets, right? These first four, of course, are, and this is out of your textbook, table 16.2, uh, gives you an idea of the density of the terrestrial planets are in the neighborhood of um, four to 5,000 kilo kilograms per cubic meter. All right, so what's that interpreted? Well, it's roughly four, uh, let's see, Earth, 5.5 grams per cubic centimeter. And the reference point there is water. Water is one. So it's five and a half times as dense as water, is the average density of the terrestrial planets. Rotational periods are here, surface temperatures, atmospheric composition, right? So Venus is very high in carbon dioxide. Earth is high in nitrogen and with a lot of oxygen. Mars is 95% carbon dioxide and a little bit of nitrogen. So why isn't Mars heating up? Where's the greenhouse effect for Mars? Well, this is 95% carbon dioxide, but <laughs> the atmospheric pressure on the surface of Mars is more like um, 35 or 40,000 feet above the Earth's surface. It's that tenuous. There's not much atmosphere there, so you're not gonna get any global warming, any uh, greenhouse effect. Magnetic fields, right? If the Earth is one, then the strength of the magnetic fields for the other terrestrial planets is nothing. Okay, now let's look at the uh, Let's see. Yeah, okay, sorry. Sorry for flipping around like that. I'm trying to get my bearings here. This compares the terrestrial planets with the Jovian planets. So notice that the density of the Jovian planets goes way down from five, four or five, down to one. Saturn's even less than one. Uranus and Neptune are, are up there. They're, they're greater than water. Rotational period, solar days, they rotate 
um, pretty fast, right? Less than a day to rotate. And for a planet that that's big, that means the surface, the outer, outer areas of the planet have to really be whipping around. Okay, their surface temperatures are very low. That's largely due to the fact that they're so far from the sun that they're, they're very cold. And this surface temperature, when you're talking about a gas giant, eh, what is the surface? I mean, you're talking about the surface of the clouds or down a little further. We don't know what the surface is like. So my guess is that we're just measuring the um, remote sensing of temperature like they do with those thermometers. They just point them at your head and measure the infrared radiation coming from your head and measure your temperature. That's probably what they've done here. So the temperature at the surface of the clouds is in that neighborhood. Uh, atmospheric composition, mostly hydrogen, huge amounts of hydrogen. And the rest is basically helium. Magnetic fields. Um, with Earth as one, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are actually not as strong as the Earth's magnetic field. But look at Jupiter. Jupiter's magnetic field is massive. What that does for any spacecraft that's traveling close to Jupiter, your electronics are, if they're not fried, then they must be protected. And even if they're protected, repeated entry into that magnetic field is eventually going to destroy your electronics. Um, and anybody visiting Jupiter, you don't want to stay far, far away from it. <laughs> Otherwise, um, you don't have to worry about cosmic rays and solar radiation and solar wind. You have to worry about the magnetic field around Jupiter will kill you. Now, they have lots of satellites. Jupiter, huge amount. Saturn, huge amount. Uranus, Neptune, even larger numbers of satellites. And that's probably due to, based on what we know about the satellites that we've been to uh, visited, they're all different from one another. So these satellites were probably captured uh, 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 Asteroids, meteoroids, whatever the case may be, just passed too close and were captured into orbit around the, the uh, gas giants because of their gravity. And that's not a bad thing. Um, during the formation of the solar system, it's believed that there was a period of time, several billion years ago, um, where um, lots of objects were flying through the solar system. And they were smashing into everything. Uh, the surface of the moon is evidence of that. Surface of Mercury is evidence of that. Cratered beyond belief. It would have been much worse, much, much worse for the inner planets if these gas giants did not exist. Mm -hmm. What the gas giants did was, was effectively sweep the solar system clear of most of those orbiting objects. So now we have fewer of them to worry about in Earth collision. In fact, we've observed um, the uh, planet Jupiter capturing uh, one of these objects. The, it was called um, Shoemaker-Levy. It was a comet. On its, on its uh, trip into the solar system, uh, when it was first observed and named by two astronomers, Shoemaker and Levy, uh, it passed too close to Jupiter, and it was ripped apart into many pieces. But it continued on in its orbit, went around the sun, back out, and the next time it came through, uh, which it was a short period comet, the next time it came through, it uh, actually crossed didn't just come close to, it hit Jupiter. 
And by that time, we had uh, space telescopes that could be trained upon it. Uh, I can't remember which ones were available. I think the Hubble was, but there might have been also another, another one that was out there available. And uh, we took uh, pictures of it. We watched the impacts themselves, each piece of that comet as it smashed into Jupiter. Okay, uh, common characteristics. These planets are so far from the sun that they are much colder. They don't get much solar radiation. Uh, they retain most of their hydrogen and helium um, simply because the solar wind wasn't strong enough to drive off the, the helium, hydrogen and helium in their atmosphere. And their gravity was so huge that it held on to this material. See, the gravity on Earth is so weak uh, and helium is so light that any helium in the atmosphere, uh, as it's being replenished from, from the Earth below, it just eventually it uh, goes into outer space. So we have very little helium in the atmosphere. And this is one of the reasons that the average density of the Jovian planets is so low, simply because of their, the amount of hydrogen and helium in their total makeup is so high. So there's a picture of Jupiter. This was taken by the Galileo mission, uh, which actually went into orbit around Jupiter uh, between 1995 and 2003. So it was there for, eight years. It's had a good long time to take a look at Jupiter. Uh, flew by lots of its moons. In fact, it, it sent a lander down to one of the moons, I think. Jupiter. Don't hold me to that. Hold on a second. No, it wasn't Jupiter. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself. But this spacecraft, Galileo, um, took some fantastic pictures and made observations of Jupiter that are just breathtaking. There's the great spot. That storm's been raging for a couple of centuries. It's the largest planet by volume and total mass. Named after the supreme Roman god of heaven because of its size and its brightness. It's 11 times the diameter of the earth and 318 times more massive. Even though its density is much less than the Earth's, um, it makes up for it in sheer size. Covered with a thin layer of clouds, we've been able to spectroscopically identify hydrogen and helium, methane, ammonia, and several other substances. Uh, the problem with these gas giants is that um, it's difficult to, to know how fast the planet is actually rotating because all you see is atmosphere. And you know, even on Earth, the atmosphere in spots will, will have wind speeds that are much higher than the average, well, not much higher, uh, different than the uh, rotational speed of the Earth. It's kind of hard to have something that's, the Earth rotates at roughly a thousand miles per hour at the equator. So we don't have any storms that big, but Jupiter does. Jupiter has massive storms and the winds are moving at, at uh, supersonic speeds. Um, so we had to use other methods to to estimate the rotation of the uh, uh, planet. So we use radio signals from within the planet, uh, which would, would have been produced by the rotation of its core. And the estimate there is that uh, it rotates once in every 0.4 solar days. So what would that be? Let's see, 24 hours, 
uh, four tenths would be about 10 hours, maybe a little over 10 hours. It will rotate one full turn. The great red spot. That's just a huge hurricane. It has a somewhat erratic shape and movement. It's roughly at this latitude on the planet consistently, but it occasionally encounters smaller storms like, like these size here and here. And when it does, it just swallows them up. Uh, it was first observed 365 years ago, so it's it's been around for quite a while. And really, nobody knows why it sustains for so long. But that's one of the research projects uh, that was tackled also by Galileo when it was there. I haven't read any reports, though. Saturn. Okay. Saturn is so is gorgeous because of its rings. And Saturn is tilted in its, on its axis so that as it moves around the sun, uh, when we observe it, sometimes the rings are up like this so we can see them fairly well. Sometimes they're down like that. Sometimes they're straight on, head on like this. So we see just this sliver. There's nothing much of the rings to see. But we sent a spacecraft out there, and it was there for about four years, called the Cassini-Huygens mission. The, the, the parent space probe was called Cassini, and it had a, uh, a separate um, lander attached to its side called Huygens. And when it got close to the, uh, let's see, which moon was it? Mm, well, I guess I'm, I'm saving that for when we talk about the moons. When it got close to one of its moons, it, it uh, dropped out of orbit and landed on the, on the moon. So we'll cover that in detail uh, in the next chapter. So what about Saturn? The rings are inclined 27 degrees to the orbital plane, which means... Uh, like the Earth is tilted 23 and a half degrees, uh, the rings are actually uh, on the equator of the planet. So if we know the, the ring tilt, we also know the planet tilt. And they're uh, 27 degrees tilted to the orbital plane. So the orbital plane is like, like here's the orbit, and it's tilted 27 and a half degrees. A little bit more tilt than the Earth has. So that gives us seasons, right? It works for gas giants as well as it does for Earth, only the effect is different. Okay, what are these rings made of? Mostly, they're thought to be ice and ice-coated rock. And, and the vast majority of them are less than 10 meters in size, right? So 10 meters is like 33 feet. So they would be, Actually, no, not 33 feet. Uh, 32 and a half feet, roughly in that range. But they're very small. And they're very far between. They're spread out. They just look like they're close together because we're looking at them from a great distance. So we don't, we don't resolve the difference between them until you get close with a spacecraft, and then you can observe the actual separation. Uh, and believe me, it's it's beautiful to see in a telescope, even though it's so far away and in a small telescope. Um, I used to have a six inch reflecting telescope. It wasn't very expensive, but it did the job. And uh, observing Saturn was just just wonderful. It has nine times the diameter of the Earth and 95 times more massive. That's so pretty big. A little smaller than Saturn. 
Average density, 0.7, so it's a little more dense than Saturn is. Now, why are those rings there? That's the question that's haunted scientists for ages. The current theory has to do with something called the Roche limit, otherwise known as the tidal stability limit. Okay. Um, when we look at an, an, a moon orbiting a planet, um, it's influenced by the planet, right? So let me draw a picture. Uh, first, let me see if the picture's the picture's not already drawn for me. Uh... Nope. Okay. So here you have this this massive planet, like Saturn, and here you have out here uh, some moon. Not the moon, but a moon. And it's orbiting Saturn. It may not be orbiting in a perfectly circular orbit. So if it's um, a, a large ellipse, then at times it'll be close and at times it'll be far away. But as long as it's orbiting Saturn, it's feeling the pull of gravity. Right? Right? From this side. This side is also feeling the pull of gravity. But because this side is farther away, this side feels less, and this side feels more. And the moons are usually rotating, too. So you're getting this differential pull distributed over this object. Well, as long as the object is far enough away from Saturn, then it can hold itself together, even though all these forces are just tugging at it from the planet. It can hold itself together. As the moon comes closer, then the, what we call the tidal forces, the differential pull based on the distance from the planet are just too great. And this force pulls greater than this force and it just rips the moon apart, just tears it apart. And it only has to tear it apart into some chunks. And if there are other chunks of matter out there from other moons, then they start banging into each other. And eventually what they do is they pulverize themselves by frequent collisions. The, they're too close to the planet. This Roche limit is the distance from the planet beyond which you can maintain the integrity of the moon and inside that limit the gravitational forces are just too great they tear it apart so inside that limit you get all these moons torn apart and then they bang against each other and they they pulverize themselves down to this small size that we mentioned earlier all right this is the Roche limit. And since most of that material is basically water ice with some rocks mixed in, um, the, it's not like a big chunk of metal which would be able to withstand the gravitational forces more so than others. Some of them are, were just rubble piles um, because they were so small. And there wasn't much holding them together. So when they reached the Roche limit, it was easy to just rip those apart. And the forces holding ice together are not as strong as, as rocks anyway. Um, now, there are small moons that survived and can be identified in the ring system, but they're not large. They've, they haven't pulverized due to impacts and what they are actually doing now, these moonlets, uh, they are shepherding the parts of the ring system. 
and they, they're they responsible for creating some rather curious structures in the ring system by their uh, gravitational effect. Okay, so what's the Roche limit for Saturn? Well, the calculation is a bit more than we have time for here, and, and I'm not real familiar with it, so I'm just gonna say it varies from planet to planet based upon the size of the planet. So Jupiter would have a different size than Uranus and, and then Neptune. And rings have been identified around Jupiter, uh, Saturn, of course, Neptune and Uranus. They all have rings. But their Roche limits are different. For Saturn, it's about 2.4 times the planet's radius. So once you get to that point, uh, inside that Roche limit, uh, you cannot maintain a fully sized spherical formed moon. So, and this was a calculation, right? Uh, without Saturn as a model. Well, maybe Saturn was a model, but the calculation itself was independent of Saturn and compared to Saturn, um, the outer ring is located at a distance of 2.3 times the planet radius. So there's fairly good agreement between the Roche limit and the outer ring, uh, which is one avenue of evidence for the origin of the rings. These little moons and moonlets uh, inside the Roche limit were just torn apart. So I've got this little... Uh, time-lapse video. It takes a couple of minutes. I thought it was just beautiful to watch. Uh, it, it's called um, Four Days on Saturn, Four Days at Saturn. And I'm going to play it now and just sit back and watch. There you go, Cassini spacecraft. fascinating to me. Okay. Um, let's look at Uranus. Unlike the other planets, Uranus uh, is tilted on its side as it travels around the sun. These pictures were by Voyager 2, 1986. Um, and uh, on that flyby, uh, we were able to determine that Uranus was actually, its poles are pointed at the sun. So it's rotating this way. Uh, 
very strange. Uh, the belief, of course, is that it was, uh, this is in response to a massive impact at some time in its history. They just knocked it off its axis. Okay, the planet itself was discovered in 1781 by William Herschel, an English astronomer. Herschel was, uh, uh, he was a rich guy and he could afford to uh, spend his time watching the sky at night. He also built some, some massive telescopes for his day. And he, since he discovered it, he was, he named it. He named it Uranus, the father of the Titans and the grandfather of Jupiter. So you have to look to your mythology to know what that means. It has a very thin ring system composed of um, a boulder sized particles. Uh, in other words, uh, a little bit larger than a meter across. And very few of them are dust sized. Average density is greater than water, but still much, much less than the terrestrial planets. So it's 90 degrees tilted from the ecliptic, that is the planetary plane. The ecliptic is um, an imaginary plane in the solar system where most of the planets and other heavenly bodies rotate. So it's not perfectly 90 degrees, right? It's, it's tilted a little bit, actually off axis like that. but it also rotates clockwise. So if you look at its North Pole, it's rotating clockwise rather than counterclockwise. And both the tilt and the retrograde rotation are probably due to some planet-sized objects smacking it at some time in its history. Okay, this was Voyager 2 flyby. So Voyager 2 flew by Uranus, took some photos, and then it flew by Neptune. So Voyager 2 actually flew by, um, let's see, it skipped Mars, went straight to Jupiter, and used the gravity of Jupiter to boost its speed. And then it went out to Saturn and used Saturn to kick it up speed more. Then it went to Uranus and that sped it up more. And then it went to Neptune. And then it out of the solar system. Neptune was discovered by uh, Johann Gall, who's a German astronomer. Um, let's see. These two Englishmen, Englishmen and Frenchmen, uh, used Newton's law of gravitation, and they predicted that Uranus motion was disturbed. Right? So this was sometime before 1846. These two mathematicians uh, took the orbital information that they had for Uranus, and they predicted the existence of Neptune because they said there's got to be something out there massive that is disturbing the orbit of Uranus. And Gall took that information and he said, okay, I'm looking for it. And he found it. He found Neptune and that, uh, as they say, is history. Uh, Neptune has a large spot on it too. All right, so it, it appears, and you noticed in that video of Saturn that there was observed a small storm in its clouds. Uh, Uranus has storms, Neptune has storms. Uh, Neptune and Uranus are very similar in their composition. Um, the question lies in 
Why is something so massive as Neptune so far out in the solar system? How did it get there? And uh, planetary scientists have been arguing this one for ever since it was discovered. <laughs> they, they haven't really settled on an answer as to how that happened. Some of the wildest theories uh, note that these uh, large planets were once formed really much closer to uh, the sun and gravitational interactions with maybe Jupiter or Jupiter and Saturn just slung them out into their current orbits. But nobody really knows. Now, here's the really interesting thing about Neptune. It is huge. It's massive. And there's this area at the edge of the, the solar system um, at or beyond Pluto, which has lots of undiscovered, we think, undiscovered objects. Even some of the size of, of Pluto were bigger. Um, but they are close enough to Neptune that when Neptune goes by, if they are close enough in their orbits, then Neptune will influence their movement. And sometimes it'll cause one or more of them to change their orbit and be uh, flung into uh, a closer approach to the sun. And that's where we believe we get some, some of the uh, rogue asteroids or comets coming into the inner solar system. Um, These things in the Kuiper Belt, which is its name, uh, in this region of the solar system, they're populated by uh, planets like Pluto and uh, smaller rocky icy bodies left over from the formation of the solar system. Okay, I mentioned this uh, grand tour of the Voyager spacecrafts. Um, and it's based upon gravity assist. So I was going to say a few words about gravity assist. Um, it's a technique for space flight that allows a spacecraft to use the mass of a nearby planet as it goes by to add velocity to the spacecraft, to assist it to go faster and get to where it's going quicker. But in actuality, um, Gravity assist can work in the opposite direction too. So if the orbit, if the orbit of the massive planet is here, like uh, Jupiter, and the satellite is moving in, then as Jupiter moves this way, then the satellite can move behind it like this. And the gravity of Jupiter will sling it around change its direction and add velocity, called delta V. But if you want to slow it down uh, and move it into a different orbit, you just come up and go in front of it, and the gravity assist will slow you down, and then that pulls you off this way and slows the spacecraft down. That's not used very often, but it can be. Um, like I said before, we want to have as high, a large a payload in the uh, mission equipment to give us all the instruments we want. And if we have to uh, send our uh, space probes deep into space, then that means that a lot of fuel has to be burned to get them there. So the payload is much smaller. But if we use this gravity assist at just the right time and time it so that we can use the gravity of these gas giants in particular, uh, then we can put more payload in there and less fuel as long as it gets them to the planet and then that'll speed them up and they can get where they're going quicker. But it's, a, it's tricky, it's um, uh, orbital mechanics. 
that comes into play. It's mathematical and so forth, and physics. Um, so uh, for a direct flight, we can go to Jupiter with a sufficient pay payload to investigate. But the only way to reach Saturn and beyond is with gravity assist because we just don't have the technology. Now we're developing technologies that will get us there quicker. Um, and one of them is the advanced ion drive. Um, just look it up, ion drive, uh, spacecraft, whatever, Google it, and you'll find a number of articles on how it works. The thing about the ion drive is, uh, it, it's not a, a huge impulse. It's not a, a big kick like a rocket engine. Like normally we think a rocket, chemical rocket engine will give you a big kick and then it shuts off and you coast the rest of the way. With an ion drive, uh, once you get into space, you crank this thing up and it's very efficient and it gives you uh, a push, a very small push, but the push is continuous for days and weeks and months and years. And eventually you, you build up a huge change in velocity. So overall, that gets you there quicker than uh, chemical rockets. Okay, so this is just a, in words, explains what I told you in that diagram. And this, you don't have to pay attention to this. I was just curious. Um, this calculation that I put up here was just more for me than it is for you. Um, the gravity assist is based upon conservation of momentum. So in other words, this, this symbol here is the Greek letter rho. Looks like a P. This is rho, and it, it's the physics symbol for the variable momentum. And remember, momentum is equal to mass times velocity, okay? So mass is always the same for, the, for this Jupiter planet, and mass is always the same for this um, spacecraft. So this is the momentum before of Jupiter, and this is the momentum of Voyager before the encounter, and after the encounter, the momentum has to be the same. Momentum must be conserved. So what happens is the momentum of Jupiter decreases a little bit and the momentum of Voyager increases. And these, that's the calculations that I've done here. And all this does is it satisfies me in terms of um, how much delta V, change in velocity, can we expect from uh, Voyager's encounter with Jupiter. And as it turns out, the, the velocity of Voyager changed by 10 kilometers per second. That much change in velocity was added to Voyager's speed. And that's a lot, right? A, a, a lot, very lot, like, uh, oh, six and a half miles per second. Just think about that. You can go six and a half miles in one second. That's a huge change in velocity. What effect did it have on the planet, though? The change in velocity to Jupiter was negligible because Jupiter's mass is so huge, right? Jupiter slowed down by 10 to the minus 24th kilometers per second. <laughs> it didn't even feel it. Okay. So that was the point I wanted to make with this calculation. You don't need to do these calculations. Not something this complicated. I was just curious and I wanted to keep it as a permanent record. So I stuck it in this uh, PowerPoint slide set. Okay. So let's move on to. Um, all right. Now we're going to get to the International Astronomical Union met and uh, they set criteria for what is a planet. Well, it, it also incorporated uh, definitions for other heavenly bodies. 
but for our discussion, uh, we're defining what makes a planet. So in 2006, this body met and they defined a planet as it must orbit the sun. Okay. So anything orbiting some other heavenly body is a moon. So a planet has to orbit the sun, number one. Number two, it must have sufficient mass for self-gravity to form a nearly round shape. Right? So any odd shapes, uh, some of the pictures that have come back from uh, close encounters with asteroids and uh, comets show really weird shapes. Those cannot be planets, even though they orbit the sun, because they're not spherical. They have to be nearly round. And third, this object, if you want to call it a planet, must then be the dominant body within its orbit. And that's the one that kicked Pluto out of the planet club. Because uh, Pluto crosses into the orbit of uh, Neptune. And when it does that, it's not the dominant body. So that means it can't be a planet. They have to call it something else. So they created this other uh, category called dwarf planets. Okay. Uh, Pluto's orbit dips inside Neptune's orbit. That makes it not dominant. That kills it. So now we have two new categories for objects that orbit the sun. One is dwarf planets. That's one of those categories. And um, Pluto's one, uh, these two asteroids, Ceres and Eris, are now designated dwarf planets. They have independent orbits. Even though they're in the asteroid belt, their orbits do not coincide. They don't cross. So they're dominant in their orbits, and they're nearly spherical in shape. Uh, excuse me. Uh, they can't be dominant in their, or in their orbits. Right, they can't be dominant. But if they're nearly spherical and uh, they orbit the sun, they're, near, they're spherical in shape, but they're not dominant. So Ceres and Eris are dwarf planets. The small solar system bodies, which is another category, uh, we'll pick that up in uh, chapter 17. So we'll, we'll let that one slide for now. They're not dwarf planets. They're other things. And they're not moons. Right? Definition of a moon also is uh, can't be a planet because it orbits, it orbits a planet. Or it orbits a dwarf planet. Um, let's see. Um, uh, okay, I misspoke earlier. Um, Ceres and Eris. Ceres, I believe, is in the asteroid belt, but Eris is out beyond Pluto, right? It's, it's in the Kuiper belt. Now this statement makes sense. Um, the Pluto as a, let's see. Now we're talking about Ceres here. So Ceres is the first dwarf planet from the sun between Mars and Jupiter. It lies in the asteroid belt. Yeah, Ceres lies in the asteroid belt. It was discovered in 1801 by this Italian fellow and named after the Roman god of agriculture and fertility. Okay, so that seems to be a common pattern. Uh, the planets and many uh, bodies, particularly dwarf planets, planets and uh, uh, moons uh, are named from Greek and Roman mythology deities. 
It's only got a diameter of 940 kilometers, so it's pretty small and is obviously the smallest dwarf planet, but it is spherical in shape. So since it's in orbits with other asteroids, it's not, um, uh, maybe because it's not dominant because it meets the first two standards. So it has to be the third one that, that disqualifies it for, a, it's not dominant in its neighborhood. The uh, Pluto is the second dwarf planet from the sun and it's beyond Neptune, obviously. Named for the God of outer darkness, <laughs> okay. Has that density, which is uh, fair, but it's, it's not great. So it's probably got a lot of ice, I guess. It was discovered in 1930 by C.W. Tombaugh at the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. He used a 13 inch refracting telescope. In those days, 13 inch refractor was huge. It was, it was a big deal. Uh, and it, was, it wasn't the largest refracting telescope there ever was. I think the largest one is 40 inches. So it's a huge lens. But that 40 inches is about the limit because once you get a piece of glass that big, it tends to distort under its own weight. And when it does that, it changes its, changes its shape and its focus. So you don't want to get any bigger than that. If you want to go bigger than 40 inches, you need to go to mirrors, reflecting telescopes. Right? So very soon after this, um, large reflecting telescopes came into, came into use. Okay. So, um, Tamba was using information that had been, uh, accumulated by Lowell, who was, Percival Lowell was an astronomer, and this observatory was named after him, Tombaugh took his observations of uh, discrepancies in the orbits of Neptune and Uranus. Because now we knew that Neptune and Uranus were there, so we can, we can use um, the laws of gravity and other orbital mechanics to predict where they are, where they should be, based on, on their uh, gravities and the gravities of other planets in the sun but there were discrepancies in even their orbits. And the idea was that occasionally there is some perturbation from another body that had not been discovered. So Tombaugh set about finding that body and he eventually did. And it, it was Pluto. Um, Pluto doesn't resemble either terrestrial or Jovian planets. In other words, it's not rocky. Uh, based upon its density, it's probably mostly uh, water ice, maybe frozen methane, frozen nitrogen, because it's so far out and cold, um, those gases are gonna freeze. This uh, spacecraft I mentioned earlier, the New Horizons, it was sent specifically to fly by Pluto. And it used gravity assist from Jupiter and Saturn, I believe, to get there quickly. And it made its closest approach on July 14th, 2015. Right? How long did it take to get there? It took more than nine years. Eventually, after it got all of its gravity assists, it was moving at 16 kilometers per second. Uh, okay, I, I misspoke. They didn't use Saturn. They only used Jupiter. Apparently, Saturn and Jupiter weren't lined up correctly to use both of them like the Voyager had done. So it had to settle for Jupiter and uh, Jupiter increased its velocity 
uh, okay, its starting velocity was 16.26 kilometers per second, just from the rocket engines. And then with Jupiter's assist, it increased to 16.985 kilometers per second, which is not as big as uh, Voyager, but uh, a nice kick. Okay. One of Neptune's moons, Triton, which is a, a huge moon, is similar in composition to Pluto. All right, so here is, um, uh, if you want to get some more information about Pluto, just uh, control click this link. You'll have to have the PowerPoint slide up in your computer, and then you control click that, or you can write it down when you're viewing the, and, and uh, stick it in your browser and go to this website, and you'll get all this information. But here's Triton, picture from uh, Voyager 2. And by comparison, the diameters are similar, uh, masses are similar, orders of magnitude similar, 10 to the 22nd, 10 to the 22nd, similar density and similar temperatures. Uh, some believe that both Pluto and Triton were large asteroids that were captured from interplanetary space. They may have been members of the Kuiper Belt. Well, Pluto is still a member of the Kuiper Belt. But uh, Triton may have uh, ventured too close to uh, Neptune and was captured. So uh, here's one of uh, Pluto's moons. Right? So these were pictures taken by the New Horizon in its flyby. And I've tried to um, adjust the size of these pictures so that they're relative. So you can see that uh, they, compared to Pluto, Charon, which is the name of this moon, is uh, very large in comparison to Pluto. That's another look. This picture was actually taken. These, this is one frame. So the New Horizon was able to photograph both of them in, in relation to each other. All right, let's see. Uh, uh, one other thing I wanted to say. The relative sizes of these two, if the satellite or the moon is much, much smaller in relation to the planet, then as the moon orbits the planet, the planet, or dwarf planet in this case, would appear to be stationary, and the moon would just orbit around it. But as a matter of fact, and in all cases where you have orbital mechanics like that, the, uh, the moon and the planet, if there are only two of them, let's keep it simple, if there are only two of them, then they orbit around a common center of gravity. So in the case of Pluto and Charon, say Pluto's here and Charon is here, then we would normally think of this, but what happens is the center of gravity for this system is outside Pluto. It's right about here. There's the center. And what happens is Pluto's going this way, Charon's going this way. And they, they orbit, both of them, they move around that center of gravity. Most planets are much bigger than their moons, so their center of gravity is inside the planet. So really what appears here is a, chain, is a double orbit. For most planets, it would be sort of a wobble. Right? The planet would just sort of wobble. And that's, that's what the Earth does in its, uh, with the moon orbiting the Earth. It's more of a wobble. And in fact, it's not only just a wobble, but because uh, two-thirds of the Earth's surface is covered in water, you get tides because the gravitational pull of both the moon and the sun causes the bulges, the water to bulge in that gravitational field 
And uh, in fact, um, I've got a, a lab in uh, physical science 103 that you're signed up for that works out that problem of tides. Okay. So here's another distinguishing characteristic of Pluto, the inclination of its orbit from the ecliptic. So the ecliptic here is roughly right through these other planets. Right? Pluto is inclined by 17 degrees from the ecliptic. Okay. So there's more evidence for the fact that Pluto was probably captured um, and not really uh, a primordial planet developed when the sun formed from the dust and gas in the, uh, in the, in the proto sun's disk. Okay. Eris is the third dwarf planet that's been discovered. Uh, and it's further out beyond Neptune and Pluto. It is actually uh, smack dab in the middle of the Kuiper belt. Uh, it was given uh, this designation and some people called it Xena, but eventually the, the name was official as Eris after the Greek God of chaos and strife. Uh, I didn't mention that uh, Charon in Greek mythology, Charon was the boat master for uh, dead souls that crossed over the river Styx into the uh, land of the dead. He, hand, he drove the boat. Okay, so the, uh, this Eris dwarf planet is three times farther away from the sun than Pluto. All right, so it is way out there. It has a highly elliptical orbit and it takes 560 earth years for one revolution. So it is, it's a long time. <laughs> Motion is very slow. So here's the, the Kuiper belt. Uh, and that's where Eris resides and lots of other things reside out there too. Um, we, it's believed that, uh, cometary materials, materials that become comets are located in the Kuiper belt and, um, planetary gravitational disturbances are often responsible for bringing those materials, changing their orbit and bringing them in to the uh, inner solar system. Now the edge of the solar system, some astronomers think it's a hundred astronomical units. I don't know where they get that number, but um, uh, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 have uh, apparently reached the heliopause, which is the word for the edge of the solar system, where the solar system's influence is, is no longer being felt and they're in interstellar space now. And I think this did happen roughly 100 astronomical units out. Uh, okay. Voyager one was launched in 1977 and Voyager two was two weeks later. Actually, no, I'm sorry. I misspoke. Voyager one was supposed to leave earlier than Voyager two, but it got delayed. So they went ahead with Voyager two's launch. Uh, and then Voyager one was launched two weeks later. So they had to make some fancy adjustments in order to get the gravity assist that was expected. The ideal launch would be for um, Voyager 2 to have left first. But they both left in 1977. And as of June 2021, Voyager 1 is at 153 astronomical units. And Voyager 2 is at 126 astronomical units from the sun. So they should be in interstellar space.
All right. Formation of the solar system. How did the solar system form? Well, obviously nobody's there to see it happen. Five billion years ago, we think it was five billion years ago. Um, so this is obvious. Any theory that's proposed for the formation of the solar system uh, must account for its present form. How did it get to be the way it is? Um, our best measurements and, and the multiple ways of measuring this, and they generally agree with one another, is that um, the solar system reached its present state about four and a half billion years ago. So if the sun started uh, its uh, nuclear reaction started about five billion years ago, then that was 500 million years that was required from the start of the sun to um, reaching roughly its present state. Okay. So here's what they think. The solar system began with a large swirling volume of coal gases and dust. Okay, that makes sense. There's a rotating primordial solar nebula. And nebula is just uh, a very thin uh, collection of gas and dust. It's thin, but it's thicker than the space around it. Let's just put it that way. It's believed to have contracted under the influence of its own gravity into a flattened rotating disk. This is the condensation theory. It condensed. Now, many believe that stars form, they need some sort of kick to get them started. So this would be a uniformitarian approach with no external influence. But it's also believed that stars form when a pressure wave arrives from some other astronomical event, like a, a star explodes nearby and it sends this pressure wave out. And that pressure wave kicks the initial condensation. And then from then on, um, the system is on its own. But once it gets started, the proto-sun in the center, which is where most of the mass collects, uh, continues to correct, contract, and as it contracts, it accumulates more gravity in a near point source. Now, conservation of angular momentum, right? Remember that concept. Uh, for example, if an ice skater is going into a spin, their arms usually start way out and their leg, one of their legs may start way out, right? And then as they draw things in, they start to spin faster and faster and faster. That's because with things spread out, their radius and their angular velocity contribute, uh, determines their angular momentum. But if momentum has to be conserved and you decrease the radius, then the velocity has to increase. So the rotational velocity increases to compensate for decreasing the radius. Uh, we covered that, I think, in chapter two. So that means the disk is going to start spinning faster to conserve angular momentum. So this is an artist's rendition, right? We start to get gravitational attraction here, and then it flattens out as it begins to rotate, right? And then we get the, the sun kicks off, and then what happens is uh, there's a battle of gravities, right? Larger bodies start to form, and as their gravity, point gravity increases, they start sweeping up material from around them in their orbits. And there may be several in that orbit to begin with, but eventually one wins and you get a planet. 
right? And that eventually leads to what we have today where most of the space is swept clean of dust and gases with a few stray objects. Uh, and the orbits of the planets are now stabilized. Um, now, let's go back and say, when we started this whole process, what were the materials? What was the origin of the materials in that primordial cloud? It couldn't have been from the Big Bang, right? The Big Bang is one theory, right? The, the universe started uh, from a point source and bang, it just started expanding. At some point along that way, elements formed, individual neutral atoms. Most of those were hydrogen, helium, and some lithium. Nothing heavier than that. Uh, then the, the, the expansion continued, and eventually things cooled down enough to where you start getting structure. You get variations in gravitational fields, and you begin to get structure in the universe. So we developed uh, galaxies and stars, and the first stars that formed were believed to be massive. They were huge, which means they burned out really fast. They burned up their fuel really fast, and in the process, they created more elements. They created heavier elements. The heaviest element that they could possibly create was iron. Nothing bigger than iron from normal fusion reactions. In order to get heavier elements, you need uh, more neutron flux, lots more neutrons. And you needed higher temperature and pressures. So one way to get that is with a supernova. When the star explodes, there's lots of neutrons and uh, the blast itself causes compression waves, huge pressures that form the heavier elements. Now, we know that the solar system could not have formed in those earlier because when that star explodes, it wipes out the whole system, anything that forms. So the solar system had to form as second or third generation. In other words, those heavier elements were formed in first generation stars and maybe even second generation stars and then the solar system formed from the gas clouds that were left over and they also had uh, the heavier elements in them so when the, the the solar system disk started to form and contract those elements were already there so what forces formed the solar system well gravitational obviously which allowed the capture of, of gases and dusts. Um, electrostatic forces, that's been proven uh, in, in the laboratory that uh, electrostatic forces were significant to formation of larger bodies. All you have to do is, is get dust in the air and friction between dust particles would transfer electrons from one to the other and create differential charges, positives and negatives, and they attract one another. So those are the two main forces that caused aggregation of dust particles, gravitational, electrostatic. And this whole process of accumulating into larger structures is called accretion. Now, how did we get isolated planets and nearly circular orbits? We know they're elliptical, but nearly circular that are in the same plane. Well, of course, like I said, the orbits are ellipses, in fact. Um, isolated planets, the big survive and consume the small. So once you start getting accumulations, 
then the big ones have more gravity. So they start picking up material and they just continue to grow. And eventually they consume, one has to win and everything is consumed in that orbit. Remember this is taking millions of years to happen. It just doesn't happen overnight. Now how about the same plane? Well, this argument continues. Um, they appear due to rotation, you get this conservation of a momentum and, but uh, you would expect that if they started as a cloud, there would be a significant amount of matter uh, above and below the plane, right? But we don't see it. Um, the visible shape of the disc would account for everything being in, in the same plane based on this theory. But um, planetary structure and other types of evidence, uh, galactic galac galaxy formation and other structures that form um, require that, actually they say that we don't have enough mass in the solar system to give us what we've got. There must be something else. So uh, a mathematical construction incorporated more mass from matter that we don't see. And they called it dark matter. We don't know what it is. It, it can't be elemental. I mean, it can't be um, hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, all the elements in the periodic chart. It has to be something else because if it were those elements, we would be able to see them by, by um, excited radiation or by absorption, right? We talked about that spectroscopy. You could detect them, but we can't. So this dark matter has to be something else, maybe just elementary particles, sub-elementary particles. And that's why we're saying that conservation of angular momentum is insufficient to explain the solar system shape or the shape of galaxies for that matter, because most, uh, a lot of galaxies are um, disc shaped. Then why are, why are the bodies, planets and other bodies, um, spherical? But the solar system is not spherical. And then why do they rotate in the same direction? Well, most do, and that would, that would be consistent with a rotating disk. Everybody's moving in the same direction, uh, but some don't. Um, most uh, have orbits, uh, actually the orbits are in the same direction. Let's see. Yeah, um, planets all orbiting the same direction, but they don't all rotate in the same direction. Some have retrograde rotation, Venus and Uranus, of course. So those answers are in the future. So what's the difference between the terrestrial and the, and the Jovian planets? Uh, what's the theoretical explanation for them? Just because we classify them as terrestrial and Jovian is not an explanation for their formation. It's just a descriptive term for each. Well, lots of theories abound for that reason. What are the facts? Well, the terrestrials are denser and smaller with less gravity. So retention of lighter gases is difficult, especially if the planet is missing a magnetic field like Mars, then the solar wind will just blow everything away. That's why the Mars atmosphere is so thin. It doesn't have a magnetic field to protect it from the charged particles in the solar wind. They're closer to the sun. 
which has stronger solar wind. So that would explain uh, a more concerted attack on atmosphere. Uh, Jovian planets are beyond the freeze line. The freeze line is a point beyond which uh, the sun's energy is not sufficient to melt uh, gases and liquids that would uh, now become solid. So these cold conditions tend to preserve the lighter materials. That's the, the end of the story there. Where'd the asteroids come from, right? Why are there not, why is there not a planet in the asteroid belt, right? So the asteroid belt is this region between Mars and Jupiter, most of them, right? There are others that um, uh, orbit in some very eccentric orbits, but most of them are in this asteroid belt. There, so far we've identified four large asteroids, one of them even large enough to be considered a dwarf planet. But still, it doesn't sweep up the material in that area uh, like the, the existing planets did in their areas. The prevailing theory is that this primordial debris that is now the asteroid belt was too close to Jupiter's gravity as it began to form. And so they, could do much, they couldn't do much more than smash into each other because the gravity of Jupiter uh, altered their orbits continuously. So they were continuously smashing into each other and they had too much energy, too much kinetic energy in order for the material to accumulate, right? If you have too much kinetic energy, then when particles reach each other, they just bounce off or they cause uh, fractures and pulverize each other because of the added energy that's supplied by the, the gravity of Jupiter. How about comets and meteoroids? These are generally considered to be fossils from the formation of the solar system. Uh, they originate, most of them, in the asteroid belt or the Kuiper belt or an area we call the Oort cloud. The Oort cloud is even further out than the Kuiper belt. Uh, let's see, do I have a description here? Uh, let's see. The Oort cloud um, is believed to be much, much farther away than the uh, Kuiper belt. And nobody really knows what's out there. But it's believed that it's, it's so far out that even uh, close proximity to neighboring stars is sufficient to disturb the orbits mm -hmm. of the Oort cloud. And when that happens periodically, um, those objects change their orbit and then it brings them into the inner solar system where we can detect them. Okay. How about planetary systems outside our own? Are there any? planetary systems in other parts of the universe? Well, we created a space telescope for just the purpose of finding those systems. The Kepler Space Telescope, that, that name should be familiar, was, was operative from 2009 to 2018 before um, it finally became inoperable. And it was used to detect planets orbiting other stars. Now, how did it do that? Well, 
The short version is it looked for dips in radiation from the star, which occurred during the transit of a planet. Right? So if you if you have a if you have a star here and there's a planet orbiting around it, right? As long as it's over here, the radiation from the star is unobstructed. But if this planet gets in the way, it blocks some of that some of that radiation. And Kepler was designed to detect a dip. So what you would see in the uh, uh, in the telescope's sensors would be if that's intensity of radiation, and uh, Kepler was looking at that star, then over time, what you would see is maybe the intensity would be set here somewhere, and it would maybe wiggle a little bit, but it would go like that. So you get a dip in the, in the intensity of the radiation. And you knew that something passed in front of that star. And based upon the characteristics of the dip, uh, how long it took and so forth, they've been able to uh, uh, deduce how far the planet is from the star, how big it is, and some other things. So far, 3,200 plus more than 3,200 stars in the Milky Way alone have planets, some of them more than one planet. Some of them we've been able to form images. Once Kepler found the planet, then we trained other telescopes on that star and we used uh, masks in the optics of the telescope to blot out the intense radiation from the star so that we could see things that were closer to it. And we've been able to image some of those planets. So I actually have bona fide photographs. They're not, there's not a lot of detail, but there's enough to see that there's something there. And it's, and it's not a star, it's a, it's a planet. <laughs> So what does that mean? That means that planets around stars are much more common than we thought. And in many cases, these systems are still in the process of forming. We should be able to find um, a, a whole array of solar systems, extrasolar systems in various stages of development and Put a, and build a more complete picture of how uh, planetary systems form. Um, there are also there are other ways. If the star is close enough, and we can uh, detect its parallax, we can even see. Uh, the planet, uh, the star wobble, then that wobble will also tell us how big the planet is. And the, the other name for this is astrometry. So you're measuring the star in some form. You're measuring its position to detect a wobble. <coughs> and this is an exaggerated version. This wobble effect <clears throat> that we're discussing uh, has to do with the uh, effect of a large body orbiting a star and causing the star to move, uh, like I described earlier with the pluto Charon moon uh, dwarf planet moon system where 
you're not actually revolving around the central body, but they're revolving together. And since the stars are usually so much bigger than the planets, the center of gravity for that system is within the body of the star. So the star, instead of looking like it's, it's moving in space, is just wobbling like this. It's, it's rotating the, the star itself is rotating around that spot rather than around this spot. Well, as it continues, the star itself rotates. But since there's a big planet out here, then it moves this way and this one moves that way around that center. Okay. So, and that wobble can be detected um, not so much by parallax. I mentioned parallax earlier, but uh, the, the better way to determine it is a Doppler shift in the star spectrum. Um, as the planet moves around this side and we're viewing from this way, then it will pull the star away from us. That means the star is moving away and the uh, light emitted is shifted toward the red. And if the planet moves around this way, then not only will be, we'll be able to see that dip in the intensity of light, but we'll also be able to see um, a blue shift because the planet now is moving toward us. We'll see a blue shift in the light from the star. And that wobble can be quantified with this Doppler shift. Okay, that's what these two statements are about. So that Doppler shift, that wobble, um, is related to this gravitational pull. And the cycle of that wobble can be used to determine the orbital period of the planet because it's, it's regular, right? And we count several cycles and we see that the planet is moving back and forth this way on a, on a periodic motion. And that periodic motion tells us the period of the planet that's orbiting the star. Once we know the, the orbital period of the planet, then we can use Kepler's third law. So there's the period T. Then we can determine the semi-major axis. And that will give us the average distance from the star for the planet. Okay. Uh, let's see, I thought there was more to that. Um, okay, um, we'll let it go for at that, and if I think of something else, I'll bring it up. Okay, um, so what were the first planets discovered beyond our solar system? Um, we, we found a whole bunch of them um, by using the Kepler telescope, but before we sent the Kepler up, we had to prove that that the method of detection worked. And to do that, um, in 1992, using the radio telescope in Arecibo, Puerto Rico, um, and that's another story, an interesting one, the, the astronomers reported the discovery of two objects revolving around a pulsar, right? And we haven't talked about stars yet, so we don't, I can't tell you what a pulsar is, um, but suffice it to say that a pulsar has a uh, regular, very regular uh, increases and decreases in emitted radiation of a particular wavelength. That's why they call it pulsar, it pulses. Um, well, I guess I am gonna give you some information. The pulsars are very dense, rapidly rotating stars. And they're rapidly rotating primarily because of conservation of momentum. So when the, when the star reaches the end of its life, it no longer has enough, uh, it's not burning fuel at a rate sufficient to uh, combat 
gravity. So the pressure of radiation is overcome by the pressure of gravity and the star collapses. And as it collapses, it, it gets smaller, right? Conserve momentum, it has to rotate faster. So these rapidly rotating stars are just the normal outcome of conservation of momentum. They have a very precise rotation period. In other words, it could be, some of them are, are seconds or even smaller. So you're talking about really fast rotating stars. Um, so if this rotational period in experience a disruption, then this would indicate the presence of an object around the pulsar, rotating around the pulsar. So these were the first objects, uh, planets discovered uh, rotating that were detected beyond our solar system. And we know they're planets because they weren't emitting radiation of their own. They couldn't be stars. Now, let's see, one last comment. Civilizations beyond our solar system. Um, scientists who search for, the, for other civilizations <clears throat> beyond our solar system are commonly uh, grouped into, actually this is a, a, a bona fide agency. SETI is Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And they listen, they use uh, radio telescopes to listen for signals from outer space. And they have to be regular sig signals that cannot be attributed to any other natural astronomical phenomenon. First, they have to eliminate signals that are coming from near Earth, like satellites, uh, other Earth-bound signals that are coming in from different directions. Um, then when they think they have identified a regular signal from further away, uh, they have to be sure it's not from one of the planets or objects in our solar system. Then they have to go the next step further, and it's just a process of elimination. Uh, the equipment now is so much more advanced than it was when they first started. Uh, computer systems now can um, operate these radio telescopes and scan the skies for a multitude of frequencies at the same time. So that allows them to cover more of the sky quicker and with a broader range of reception. Um, it's highly unlikely that advanced extraterrestrial civilizations will be found, whether they exist or not, uh, simply because the distances are so great. And uh, we found no other evidence to suggest that there are places out there that would support extraterrestrial uh, civilizations. But be that as it may, uh, the research that's being done in the name of search for extraterrestrial intelligence, that research is producing uh, knowledge gains and technology developments that may become useful for other purposes in the process. And this happens a lot in science, um, especially in uh, crisis events, like especially wars. Wars are, are bad on their face, but at least sometimes advances in technology come out of them. Uh, for instance, um, World War II uh, accelerated the development of radar. Uh, it also, World War II and the Korean War accelerated advancements in medical technologies and medical techniques. Um, the, the list is quite extensive actually. <laughs> but uh, um, other purposes for these developed technologies will eventually be found. There's no doubt about it. So 
even if they don't find extraterrestrial intelligence, um, we can still use the technologies that were developed to advance their efforts. And I believe that's it. That's it for chapter 17, 16, 15, 16. So we got chapter 17 and chapter 18 to go and the semester will end.